We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Andre, and I'm here with... Rob H. This is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. Uh, so for folks listening uh, this week, uh, very strange. We are recording this on uh, U.S. election night, so we have no idea what the results are, even though the uh, video and audio versions of this episode will come out after election night, although we still might not know what the results are. We don't know. <laughs> it's all speculation at this point, but in, all in case you're wondering why we don't make any comment on it, that's why we're recording before we have any idea. That's right. Results are just now starting to roll right. in from different states in the on the East Coast, so we've got quite a few hours before things really hit the fan, yeah. so to speak. The states where, uh, with my... you know, one percent of uh, places reporting, they can call the result. <laughs> yeah. All righty. Yeah. But uh, my wife went to uh, help, tried to help polling places today. Mm -hmm. She signed up kind of late. So they really couldn't find anything for her to do. So I thought she was going to go there and have a terrible experience and come back and dive headfirst into a glass, maybe bottle of <laughs> wine, and then take me along the ride with her. But she did not. Okay. She was good. Right. And uh, it said it was a fine experience and didn't see anything. Uh, for the most part today, I was driving around uh, a little bit for kids mostly. Mm -hmm. And uh, I do live in Florida, which hasn't been known to handle many things very well but <laughs> when it comes to, to anything but becoming a meme we're real good mm. at that but uh, it seemed pretty peaceful everywhere you know there were some interesting signs out i'll say that and uh, a lot of people bought a lot of flag whoever if you were like a flagpole for your truck seller right you made some ah, money yeah, in the yeah. last month <laughs> you you had a good month this was a good month for you because there's people like all over the place and uh we actually got caught up in a parking lot f with a one of those uh like truck rallies mm -hmm. for trump or whatever where it was the vietnamese M american federation or something i don't know what they're called but i had to look up their flags because there's a yellow flag with three red stripes mm -hmm. on it and i was like is this a new flag i've never <laughs> seen this flag. And it, it, it is fairly new but i just didn't know and uh but apparently the vietnamese love trump did not know that, but that's that good to know. That particular group does, perhaps. <laughs> yep, it's all about China. He's hard I on see. China, and they don't like China. So at least that's what Wikipedia is. <laughs> yeah, that. Uh, that's my big sort of news information source. That's my knowledge truly, base. Truly I'm going reliable to Wikipedia these days. citation. <laughs> right, you know that's that's a APA approved <laughs> right. citation. Wikipedia dot com mm -hmm. slash some dude. <laughs> all right. Yes. All right. So we do have our thankful and infinite podcast coming we up. Do? That will be the day after Thanksgiving. Those will be released. I am led to is believe it? on. Uh, is it? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> we haven't. I thought that, a ton we still I thought haven't we, sorted out and it's coming up. We haven't sorted that out yet. Okay. I thought we were releasing it the day after. Thanksgiving. I thought we were releasing it on Thanksgiving, but we're going to have it recorded prior so we can we yeah. can decide. It's as simple as saying, yes. when will this go live? That is true. We will all make it go live at the yeah. same time. So you will. So that week, if you listen to all three po podcasts, you will only have one podcast to listen to. Well, we, we still ours, might have a second ours, episode. Ours will be the longest because we might add something onto the end or have a second we'll episode. We'll probably just we'll have, definitely a have We'll definitely have a second episode. episode. Yeah, that's, but, uh, Let's be honest. But yeah, that's happening. HD guys, that'll be their episode for... Uh, in case we, and there's nothing wrong with that. Hearing this yeah, for yeah. the first time, uh, we didn't actually say what it is. It's a three-podcast, six-man crossover event. We're going to have Ara and Brayden from uh, a, the HDTV and Home Theater Podcast. They're the HD guys. We're going to have DJ from the Bright Side Home Theater Podcast. And we're going to have Tom, myself, and Lee Overstreet from AV Rant. We're all going to get together and do a Thanksgiving right. episode. So <laughs> It's a six-man, but 50% of them are from our podcast. Yes, that's true. I'm I'm hoping <laughs> recording Zoom in OBS will work, because that's, that's my plan at the moment. <laughs> mm. 
I think well, I mean, we're all going to record. Locally, we're all going to record right? our audio. audio there, there will be an audio version for sure. I'm just hoping I can make a video. The version. video is going to be probably. There are no promises for the video, but an attempt will be made. An attempt will be made. That's right. Oh, man. My puppy's in here. Mm-hmm. She is not feeling well. Oh. If those of you that care about my animals, Violet is uh, is experiencing some sort of allergic reaction. Ooh. Her belly is all got all red, so mm. the doctor told me to give her Benadryl, and I did, and she got sleepy and yep. <laughs> didn't bark at any of the workers in the house for the first <laughs> time ever. I'm like, Yeah, there's a side note. Dogs. Workers still in Tom's house. So, Right, right. That's, that's just become so commonplace, right. but... Uh, so, but now her, she's gone from being red to have being kind of hivey. Mm-hmm. So we're going to keep a close eye on her. And if I don't see any improvement by tomorrow afternoon, I'm taking her into the vet. Or at least calling yeah. them and making an appointment. And yes, workers. But mm-hmm. I think <laughs> tomorrow's the big day. Okay. I think... I think that the cabinet guy will finally be done tomorrow, which I thought he was going to be done last Friday. Yeah. But he... I still am missing a door and a couple of handles and a couple of other things, but he should be able to knock that out in a couple of hours, I think. Uh, and then the people that do the, they're going to install the gas range yeah. and get all that stuff done. They come tomorrow, mm-hmm. supposedly before noon. And uh, the only thing left at that point will be backsplash. And the backsplash guy comes on Monday. So tomorrow, I today I got a, 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 a hooked up, dishwasher right. for the first time in months <laughs> <laughs> we haven't used the dishwasher in so long that the little the little pods that you put uh-huh. in them were dusty nice <laughs> now by by my powers of deduction you must have countertops this means last we I heard do. you didn't have countertops they oh i didn't take, have countertops they had to last be taken time. Back, right. they took them back fixed or whatever yes they 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 brought them and they installed them and that's all right. that's all done they look very good uh i have one small issue that i'm t- trying to talk to them about but they're not real good at responding so but i have countertops okay. and they function and the there was other issues that i mean if you guys with the too long the the, the short, too long didn't read version is more than this podcast can yeah. bear but there were things like the they installed the dishwasher and i looked at the cabinets and went well that's not going to work because a couple of doors don't open anymore because of where the the door was for, for the <laughs> dishwasher the the it's it's in like in the, the 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 crook of the l okay and it the they were supposed to be a kind of a spacer and there wasn't and the cabinet guy was like huh well, that's a problem i'm like i know <laughs> so things yeah. things okay. but we're getting close bit, rob getting close bit by bit getting close bit by bit my wife has been saying we're almost there for like three months yep. It's a two-day job. It is a two-day job. Maybe three. Tops. <laughs> Tops. They're going to knock it right out. So, yes. It is a thing. All right. This is AV Rent, the podcast that answers your home theater and AV questions. To get your questions answered, all you have to do is ask. You ask by emailing us a question at avrent.com. You go to avrent.com. Leave us a comment there. Facebook.com slash avrentpodcast. YouTube.com slash avrent. You can also contact us directly, Rob at avrent.com. His Twitter is at first reflect. I'm Tom at avrent.com. My Twitter is at avrent underscore Tom. First, we're going to thank our listeners of the week. To become a listener of the week, you just support the podcast in some way. One of the ways you can do that is going to avrant.com and click on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link. This week, we were extremely active in the number of people that did that. And I want to thank you for going to uh, clicking on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link and leaving us a PayPal donation. So we want to thank Alan. Aris, Kevin, Chad, and Bertrand for doing that this week. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Yeah, sure seems like the holiday season is upon us. Uh, Alan, Aris, yeah. Kevin, Chad, and Bertrand, thank you very much for those PayPal donations. Uh, very pleasant surprise, and we appreciate it very much. Thank you very much. And we also want to thank our 122 patrons over at Patreon.com. Patreon's a service where you sign up to be a, a, say a, a subscribing member mm-hmm. of our audience where every month you they take some money from you and give it to us, a minimum of a dollar. And uh, we had 122 patrons this month, so thank you very much to all of our patrons. We, we love you. Yes, we do. Patreon.com slash Podcast. if you would like to sign up. Think of it as a voluntary subscription, if you please. And uh, big thanks to our 122 patrons over there. 
Okay. So if you can't support us uh, financially, we totally understand. Just support us in some other way and let us know what you did. And we will thank you for it. So we will thank Steve at nextgenhometheater.com. Uh, Steve helped Rob secure his request for the free PlayStation VR camera adapter for PS5 mm -hmm. by letting him know that the key to success on Sony's website is the insanity approach. Just cr keep trying the same thing over and over until you get the result you want. And what does yeah. that mean, Rob? So uh, there was a website that got tweeted out, uh, which I retweeted. I'm like, hey, if you have PlayStation VR and you're going to get a PlayStation 5, you need to get this adapter for the camera for it to, it to work. And uh, they tweeted out the link where you should, could supposedly do that. Um, so I went there and it says, okay, uh, you know, choose your country. That's fine. Uh, enter the serial number of your PlayStation VR. I'm like, okay, that's fine. And then it said, oops, something went wrong. We can't proceed. And I was like, okay. So I gave that a, like, a couple tries, you know, I've tried capital letters on the letters that were in the serial number right. and that type of stuff. I'm like, yeah, nothing worked. Okay, I was like, whatever. It's not up and running. Check the regular website. The links were broken. You know, it just said 404 errors and stuff. I'm like, okay, whatever. It's not ready. And then, uh, so I tweeted that out. And then Steve was like, oh, I just tried it about 200 times in a row. And eventually it worked. I was like, okay. So uh, Sounds like I went back to the link and I, uh, again, entered the serial number. I think I, th I only did it about 20 times. And yeah, it just worked randomly one time. Worked, you know. So just keep trying the same thing over and over, uh, expecting a different result eventually it was a different result yeah all right well that's that's high that's uh almost certainly some sort of bandwidth issue where they're just getting so many hits that who knows it just re returns an error i got yeah. an email saying we've received your request so i'll take that as a good sign <laughs> there you go all right, uh, Blake, let Gary Yacoubian from SVS know that he purchased the combo of a PB4000 and a PC4000 for his 8,000 cubic foot basement because of our recommendation. Blake says SVS was great to work with, as usual. Congratulations, Blake. Thank you for talking us up. That's right. Uh, Stan, let us and the acoustics know that he bought a pair of Sierra Luna Duo LCR speakers after hearing about them on our podcast. Yeah, congrats to you, Stan. Those are going to be some fantastic sounding speakers. And we got notes of gratitude from Brandon, Scott, RSJ, and Chad for keeping the podcast going and staying upbeat and <laughs> what can only be called the year. I don't even know if I can if I can give it a proper name on this podcast and keep it PG. <laughs> it's the year that we wish had never happened. Yeah. Let's just the the year we, that that we want to forget that everybody that all the jokes that we used to make about how. You know the next last year stunk at the end of the you know, the new you know, New Year's Eve. You're mm -hmm. like tweeting out, "Oh, bye bye, night." You know, 2019, you suck. 2020, you're gonna be great. Yeah, for once, <laughs> yeah. that's not a meme. That's not a that's not a glib comment. That is literally the truth. Okay, <laughs> I won't even <laughs> jinx it by saying anything. I will just say thank you. To Brandon, Scott, RS, Jay, and Chad. Really do appreciate those notes of gratitude and encouragement. And uh, big time thanks to everybody who continues to listen and send in your questions and email us. Uh, wonderful to keep this community going. So big thanks from us to you. All right. In the news. First of all, i got some personal news that I am not going to share with you, but I will <laughs> tease it. Okay. So uh, there's been an opportunity for me coming up that is going to significantly change uh, my life and how you know I operate around this house and, uh, and interact with you guys. So uh, that's coming up soon. I can't officially announce it yet, but uh, stay tuned. Okay. Those of you that have been uh, have uh, have been following me for a long time might have a clue as to what's going on <laughs> but uh, or maybe a guess. But I will say it's very exciting, and it'll uh, you'll just you'll have a lot more opportunities to interact with me. I'll put it to you that way. Cool. All right. Also in the news, AMD announced their six thousand series Radeon graphics card. Oh, they're sold out. Sorry. Yeah, probably. they're sold out. Sorry, Bitcoin miners got them. But the Bitcoins got them. They're gone. The six thousand series Radeon graphic cards have been announced. That's it. Uh, the RX 6800 is 508. No, it's sold out. Sorry. Uh, 6800 is uh, $580, releasing November 18th. And AMD claims it has some slight advantages over the $500 NVIDIA 3070. 
It's got a much bigger number to only have slight, <laughs> slight, <laughs> slight advantages. I mean, I went from thirty seventy to sixty eight hundred. More so, RAM, yeah. but slower RAM. So we'll see. All right. <laughs> The RX 6800 XT is 650, and it's also sold out. It's releasing uh, November 18th and goes head to head with a $700 NVIDIA 3080. Uh, the RX 6900 XT is $1,000, releases December 8th, it's sold out. And uh, game wise, competes with NVIDIA's $1,500 3090. And yes, they all have HDMI 2.1. They can apparently use the HDMI forum version of VRR. VR or uh, variable refresh mm -hmm. rate, and in, in addition to AMD's own free sync, they are all unfortunately are sold. Out. <laughs> so I mean, weirdly, like <laughs> all the reports, because AMD didn't highlight that it has HDMI 2.1 in their presentation, like none of the tech journalists who are supposedly on right. top of this stuff even mentioned it. I'm like, I wonder if there's any mention on the website. I found it. I tweeted it out. I'm like, really? Nobody else cares. Right. Nope. It's not a big deal nah. to anybody else. Um, yeah, they're also saying that if you pair an AM, uh, AMD brand uh, Radeon graphics card, one of the new 6000 series, with an AMD Ryzen uh, CPU, that they can sort of do some memory sharing that you can't do if you're mm. using like an Intel CPU with a Radeon graphics card. So there's supposed to be some company synergy going on there. If you want the maximum performance, you use an AMD CPU and GPU together. Maximum That's right. power. That's right. All right. So if you're going to be one of those all AMD guys mm -hmm. or gals, then you'll get some advantages. And if you're not, then you probably won't notice because you can't get it anyways because the Bitcoin guys all bought it. And that's why they mentioned two po uh, HMI 2.1 because <laughs> Bitcoin guys don't care about that. They don't. They do not. Not one bit. <laughs> They're like, this is a selling we'll point? How is this a selling VGA point? VGA <laughs> output. 640 by 480. We're just fine. That's, we're fine. You just need a pixel, a couple. There's enough pixels to tell us how much money we made. <laughs> Anthem announced their new AV uh, receiver and pre-pro model. Some go all the way up to 15 speakers, and Canadians are getting some attractive pricing compared to the current U.S. dollar exchange mm -hmm. rates. The MRX540 receiver tops out at 7.1, but only has five amps built in, 100 watts each. $600 USD, $2,000 Canadian. Uh, the MRX740 goes up to 11.1, but only has 7 amps built in, uh, 5 uh, or 140 watts, 2 or 60 watts. So I guess that's, that's what backs. Anthem does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, there's nothing wrong with that, no. really. Uh, $2,700 USD and $3,000 Canadian. I know. What? Fantastic exchange what? rate on that. The next that's one's even better. <laughs> Somebody forgot to carry a one or <laughs> yeah. something there. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> The MRX 1140 ventures into new ground with 15.2 channels, 11 amps built in, uh, 5 at 140 watts, 6 at 60 watts, uh, 3,700 US, do uh, US dollars on $4,000 Canadian. Somebody forgot that it's not supposed to be just $300 more. <laughs> that one is slide. the deal. Like the MRX 540, 400 Canadian dollars more when it started at 1,600 US, which uh, yeah, I mean, that's yeah, still that's... actually pretty decent on the exchange rate, but not like wildly out of sync, but like... The next one, especially the MRX 1140. So, um, yeah, for 3,700 US dollars for an AV receiver, because this is a receiver, the MRX 1140, yeah. that can do nine point, I'm pretty sure it can actually do genuine point two, point six, as in independent subwoofers, independently calibrated subwoofers. So 9.2.6 on that MRX 1140 for $3,700. Um, I mean, Emotiva does have the XMC2 Pre-Pro at $3,000 that can do 9.1.6. Uh, but to actually have amplifiers and everything built in there, $700 more, like, I, I think that's a first at that price point. Mm. Uh, yeah, and then they've got Pre-Pros too. And for the Pre-Pros, they have the AVM70 Pre-Pro matches the 1140 which is the one we just discussed, but with XLR outputs instead of amps, so it can do 9.2.6 for $3,500 USD or $4,000 Canadian. Yeah, so the Canadian price is exactly what? the same, but it's a little bit cheaper in the US, which, hey, amazing that the pre-pro version is actually <laughs> slightly cheaper than the AV receiver version. I, there's going to be some sort of, somebody's getting fired over at Anthem right now for, the, for this math And I mean, problem. these are on their website, so it's as, I know, a, I as official you. as it can be. Hey, 
you hand somebody on uh, the, the web designer and say this is the price of everything they're not going to look twice yeah. at it not one bit put in the numbers so if you want to bump it up to the flagship it's the avm 90 it goes up to 15.4 with four completely independent subwoofer outputs uh, and crazy 32 bit 768 kilohertz stacks on all channels so yay uh seven thousand us dollars or 8500 canadian so that actually sounds like the reasonable difference in price but <laughs> whatever it's stupid so they all have hdmi 2.0 out of the box but anthem promises an hdmi 2.1 hardware update will be available next year they all use the latest ARC Genesis, which is the Anthem Room Correction, with a new mic that sure looks awful like a U-Mic 1 and no more on-screen display. All setting control is handled on your computer or tablet. has no Aura 3D, and like three people went, <gasps> <Yep>. oh! <laughs> DTS X Pro is on board with, for the 15-channel models, but Neural X Pro cannot be applied to Dolby signals according to the manual. Mm -hmm. So... So front wides, that's the thing, right? If you're going to do the 9.2.6 okay, yeah. or 9.4.6 in the case of the AVM90, uh, yeah, to upmix signals to, uh, and make use of the front wides, it, at least according to the manual, it described that uh, DTS-X and DTS Neural X Pro can only be applied to DTS signals. It can't be applied to Dolby signals. Uh, so, I mean, of course, a ton of content is in Dolby signals that, uh, you know, is not full Dolby Atmos and a Apparently, at least according to the manual, out of the box, unless there's a firmware update at some point to change that, uh, you won't be able to uh, upmix front wides for those Dolby signals. So that's one little drawback there. All right. Amplifiers can be re uh, can all be reassigned except for the center channel, uh, which is great. It is, yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. Like manual that. indicates Dolby volume is no longer separated into independent equal loudness curves and dynamic range compression. So you get both whether you like it or not yeah so i mean this <laughs> that, is the way that sucks. dolby volume <laughs> is applied in everything else that has dolby volume right. normally when you apply dolby volume uh what it would do is mostly dynamic range compression but it was also doing some curves of equal loudness similar to like odyssey dynamic eq or yamaha's y pow volume or the fletcher munson curves if you want to think of it that way uh those were being applied but it was it was both together that was the normal way and that is the way it's described in the manual for these new anthem models uh because it it just mm. gives, uh, you know, that you can set it to off, low, medium, or high for Dolby volume. That's the way it was. In their prior models, they had implemented Dolby volume in a way that nobody else had in a superior way, in my opinion, which was that they separated the curves of equal right. loudness part from the dynamic compression part. Which is what Odyssey does. Right? Exactly, yeah. So you could apply curves of equal loudness uh, via Dolby volume, just that part of it, without applying dynamic range compression. That's what I want to do. Again, I don't know. I maybe it's just a oversight of the know why they think you want why you want dynamic range compression why right. you would want that oh i mean everybody like, has it you know i mean odyssey has oh, I know, dynamic but... volume <laughs> yamaha has i mean it, I, but... I but i don't i don't know why that's not by itself I like I, even if you took the equal loudness stuff and put it with something else that would be maybe make a little bit more sense but these two things seem to be the not quite the opposite but they work against each right. other in a lot of ways, in my mind. So it's very odd to have them do so that. So the two but things whatever. that we've spent some time on with the DTS uh, Neural X Pro only being applied to DTS signals and this uh, Dolby volume. Now, again, I'm just reading that from the manual. So maybe it'll yeah. be changed in a firmware update. Maybe the manual isn't like fully completed yet. And that's placeholder text. Uh, I could be completely wrong about those things. But assuming that yeah. the manual is correct, uh, those would be the sort of the two things where... I would maybe still be looking at Mono Price's HTP1, which is a pre-pro and it's four thousand dollars. So uh, right, you know right. the price is higher, and you're going to have to have external amps. But what I love that Mono Price did with the HTP1 is uh, like they don't have DTS X Pro yet. Uh, they say they're looking at adding it, but Mono Price was just like, hey, we'll just create our own matrixing. That uh, if you're listening to a um, seven point one signal uh we're gonna create front wides for you uh and we're gonna create top middles for you <laughs> like they're just gonna matrix that themselves with their own processing uh they're gonna put in uh over at mono price with the htp1 they put in their own curves of equal loudness because dirac which is the room correction that they use in that unit doesn't have curves of equal loudness they put their own in so 
those two features are the things that still keep the uh, Monoprice HTP1 at the very tip top of my list. Uh, those are advantages that they maintain over Emotiva's pre-pros over these Anthem ones, at least according to the information we have right now. But yeah, uh, mainly I just want to mention these, these Anthem ones, the prices, definitely attractive. I mean, still expensive stuff, but it's just nice to see this 15 speaker capability is coming down in price. Cool. Uh, sorry, I clicked off for a second here, and I'm now having to move a thing, mm -hmm. and that's it. All right, Netflix Canada was a little ahead in announcing their price increases. Now, Netflix USA prices are going up, too. I did read that, mm -hmm. and I was like, wait a second. <laughs> so, basic, uh, the, it was the standard definition one screen remains at $9 a month. Standard HD two screens goes up a dollar a month to $14 a month, and premium 4K four screens goes up to two dollars to eighteen dollars a month yeah so, so canadian whatever. prices are only one dollar more uh so we're getting by that measure so, we're getting but you a get the anthem stuff rate. for cheaper so what you complain about i know you complain about it's still nearly twenty dollars a month for the 4k version but it's almost twenty dollars a month in the u.s too uh yeah, yeah. uh honestly i kind of want to encourage people to start canceling your netflix subscriptions because they're getting a bit out of hand in my mm. opinion anyway these prices are getting a bit out of hand well, they got to stop canceling everybody's favorite shows. They That's what they really got to that. do. Yes. That's the big thing that I think is going to make people start to well, flee I mean, Netflix. Why would I invest in any new Netflix show when the likelihood is the story is not going to be allowed to be completed? That's a yeah. really... I don't understand that strategy at all. It, like They're saying, oh, well, we, we only want hits that bring in new subscribers, but we're not going to like complete the story for you. So why would I ever yeah. trust them? Why would a show ever become a hit? I want to see if it's going to be able to have a conclusion. Right. Weird. They when they when they first started off it was like every show got yeah. renewed <laughs> no matter seasons. what because they, they you know Wolf Creek got like seven like five seasons and everybody hated it. You know I didn't know any, I don't know anybody that watched more than one season of that thing. Well maybe that wasn't the name of it. I don't know. It was something about wolves. But uh I never watched it. But uh you know a lot of good stuff out there it's like oh it's already canceled. I'm like what is yeah. it? I haven't even get a chance to watch it yet. You know. Mandalorian season 2 came started up, started up this week though. So That's you haven't watched Plus. the first episode. It's pretty good. Disney Plus, which is much cheaper and includes 4K and HDR and Dolby Atmos for everybody. They don't have tiers. Yeah, but it doesn't quite have the content. It doesn't quite have the content yet. And yeah. once they have the subscribers, the price is going to get jacked up on that. So enjoy yeah. it while you can, folks. And that's right. Uh, comments here. Herb from Cross Spectrum Labs tweeted to say that Mini DSP hadn't hasn't made U Mic two units available to dealers just yet, but once they do, he'll definitely consider offering them with individual calibrations. He but he doesn't anticipate offering the U Mic X array microphones through Cross Spectrum unless it's just as a straight reseller, since the U Mic X uses four capsule clusters and not individual omnidirectional mics. Uh, Herb says it would be nearly impossible to offer a useful calibration, certainly not at a highly affordable price. So that's why we like Herb, because Herb's like, eh, <laughs> I could charge you for it, but I can't really do it all that well. So, you know, the why don't we just not? value proposition. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> why, don't, why don't we just not? Uh, Nick. Nick, uh, since I mentioned I, I'm interested in horror movies, Nick recommends uh, aeroplayer.com. I have not, I got, did get this email, hmm. have not had a chance to check it out. Arrow's Blu ray releases of mostly horror and cult classics are limited production runs and they tend to sell out quickly, but luckily they've expanded their streaming service beyond the UK and it's only $5 a month. At the moment, they have apps for Apple TV, Fire TV, Roku, and Chromecast. Mm -hmm. Aero player.com. Check it out. What did I watch the other night that I yawned my way through? <laughs> uh, the autopsy of Jane Doe. I th I was like, when's the scary part happening? <laughs> Never heard I of just, it. Yeah, it was on a list for scariest movies on Netflix I right see. now. I'm like, okay. Or maybe it was Hulu. I think it was Netflix. Carl. Carl wrote to, to Denon to ask if they have begun the HDMI 2.1 hardware upgrades for the X8500H yet, since the AVR A110 exists now. But of course, it has the issue where 4K 120 uh, variable refresh rate doesn't work, and we don't know when or if, even if, it will be fixed. And rep Denon's reply is that they are anticipating a December or January rollout for the X8500H replacement boards. So there you go. We shall we see. The next Famous last H. words. We shall see. Yes. <laughs> Everybody cross our fingers. Yeah. Bob in the Philippines. Bob has a happy ending to his LG OLED power board replacement tail. Well, it couldn't have gone much more south unless you were in my house and it had something to do with countertops. 
Last week, the LG service subcontractor called to say they had received the parts from LG and the technicians would be at Bob, Bob's house on Tuesday between 9 and 10 a.m. Three technicians showed up on this door on time this time. Yeah. So that's exciting. That's exciting. Uh, they used the YouTube video that Bob had downloaded to figure out how to replace the power board. Only discover that his E-Series OLED doesn't come apart the same way the C-Series unit does in the, in the video. Removing the back panel of the E-Series is, is much trickier and required careful prying the, up the back with plastic sp spludgers. Spudgers. Spudgers. Think like basically the guitar pick shapes. You know, it's the things yeah. you jam into anything where plastic yeah. meets plastic or plastic meets glass. Yeah. yeah. So the technicians didn't have any, but luckily Bob works on interior car panels all the time. So he had a bunch. Jeez, Bob, why don't you just do this <laughs> I yourself? I man. He pretty much Bob, did. you know what? Clearly, LG will subcontract to anybody. So you could be doing this. <laughs> pretty much. Yeah, he wanted to mention on the uh, E-Series, uh, there's basically these little uh, clips. It's a male-female plastic clip system. Yeah. So yeah. pulling that out, you have to pull it straight out. Uh, otherwise, you're going to snap one of the clips, you know, mm. if you wiggle it to side to side so yeah it was a bit dicey but they managed to do it without breaking anything all right well good on them because i would have broke it for sure once they finally had access bob was surprised to see the obvious burns and overheating marks on his oled power board turns out getting it replaced was definitely the right move so even though it was a pain he says thank you for prompting him to proceed the board was replaced, uh, his OLED hung back up on the wall, and he made the technician stick around while he plugged everything back in and tested it all. He wasn't about to let them leave before making sure his HDMI input still worked. <laughs> yeah, I was the same way with my dishwasher. I was like, dude, you're not going until that thing runs a cycle. <laughs> Happily, it's all good, except the warning that he should replace his power board still pops up. The technicians had no idea what to do about that, so Bob called LG. The, the technicians have had no idea what to do about anything until right. you told them what to do, Bob. So no, let's not belabor the point and have you continue to tell us that the technicians were clueless. We know. Uh, Bob called LG. They said once they receive the receipt of the completed work order, they'll update their database and he should eventually get an update over his internet connection that will remove the warning. <laughs> yeah. We'll see you in Keep about Keep checking Emotiva's website for, for the firmware update. They'll be coming, Bob. We'll see if that happens. But all in all, he's happy the repair is done. Hopefully this is the end of the story. So... Uh, he's got we got some pictures here of the old board which is not looking great yeah and the new board which looks considerably better dude that one thing looks like an airbag deployed on it <laughs> what's going on with that <laughs> In any case, uh, I, right. I'm glad ultimately uh, our advice was not leading him completely astray. So uh, let's hope all's well that ends well. Bob, thank you for going through the whole ordeal and uh, letting other people know what they might be in for if they have that warning too. I will tell you, Bob. Uh... Yes, this is a, <laughs> this is a word. This is a, I think the, the thing that the, my takeaway of this is uh, don't have your TV break in the Philippines. <laughs> That's pretty much it. All right. Uh, some questions here. RD. RD wants to replace his five-year-old 65-inch Vizio this year. He's decided to get an, L an LG CX OLED. Now he just needs to figure out which size. The biggest one. <laughs> the biggest one. Most of the time, there are two people watching, and they're on the couch directly in front of the TV. But it does have a seat off the side, and this Vizio looks really washed out from that side angle. And OLED will be much better on that front, correct? Yes, Absolutely. unequivocally. Uh, yes. Yeah, that is that is as definitive of an answer as you can possibly get mm -hmm. in this this game. You go in, go into an OLED or a plasma. You know, I mean, even a CRT <laughs> would, have, <laughs> it would have been. You get better. Would have been better better viewing angles here so his normal viewing distance is nine feet he'd be willing to get to get a full motion tv mount so he could pull the tv 18 to 24 inches closer given all that do we think the 1500 dollars difference in price between a 65 versus a 77 inch would be worth it it's a lot of money uh so if you pull it two feet closer mm -hmm. you're now seven feet away yeah. from a 76 or a 65 inch tv mm -hmm. 60 so to give you the numbers, uh, if you're seven feet from eyes to screen, the 65-inch TV will give you a 37-degree field of view, uh, which is pretty decent. Yeah. That's within SMPTE yeah. spec for uh, HD TV, uh, whereas the 77-inch OLED from seven feet eyes to screen will give you a 43.4-degree field of view, and you're much closer to cinematic. If the TV ends up being nine feet away, uh, there's no question I would want the 77-inch if there's any way for you to afford it. Now... $1,500 is a lot of money. It is a big it price is. difference. And the 65-inchers are getting 
uh, cheaper, faster than the 77s because they can simply manufacture them more easily with the uh, plants that they have available. So I can't tell you, you know, uh, with what your particular financial situation is, only you can decide that. But I, I will simply say, if you're just going by field of view and the viewing distances that you have, the arguments are all there in favor of the larger 77 inch size. It would in no way be a waste. It would certainly not be too big. Uh, so as long as you are able to afford it, I would urge you to go with the larger size, if at all possible. Right. Uh, 43 is kind of about where I like to... Yeah, be, it's really I nice. Think. Yeah, <laughs> it's movie quite a good. Really nice. Yeah. Um. So you know, but, but now we're talking about getting the because I I think in his case, if I'm reading this question sort of correctly, in his case, the the question is, do I get the 77 and mount it on the cheap mount that's just right on the wall, or mm. do I get the expensive, you know, you know, movable mount, and then get the smaller one, and then you know, I I end up saving some money, but you know, it's less than fifteen hundred dollars for this, so therefore that that that's the. I don't think the answer he was looking for was get the big TV and move it closer. and get the get the expensive <laughs> well, mount. I'm I don't simply, think that was the answer he was. I'm looking simply for. saying if you did, uh, right. there's no downside to it uh, other than you've spent more money. I mean, the thing is, you already have a sixty-five inch TV, so you can decide already. You know, is that large? If it's large enough, and you know, the 65 inch OLED is going to be the exact same size picture. It's just going to look better. It is going to be a superior looking image that is the same size. If you want the larger image, then, you know, the 77 inches there, it just costs more. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let us know what you go with. Mm -hmm. uh, I agree that from the size perspective, uh, I, I, I honestly, if you go to the 65, you got to get the mount. You got to. Right. Uh, there's no getting around that, I think. But the, uh, it, if you can get both the, the mount and the TV, I think you'll be happiest, but I'm sorry. I don't like to tell people to spend more money, but if your only option is this TV and you will accept no other solutions other than this, then th th that's what we would recommend. Marcus. Marcus is buying a new house. There is an upstairs loft that he'll be using as a full home theater, but his question today is about the living room. It is already pre-wired for five speakers, three up front, two in the back, but they... Oh, I didn't even have to read it to know it. They are all in the ceiling. Mm -hmm. Should you make use of them or buy, just buy regular bookshelf speakers and leave the pre-wires unused? Uh, I would use the surrounds. Yeah, I'd be okay with in-ceiling surrounds in a living room that's, you know, yeah. open and has a loft upstairs and everything. In-ceiling surrounds are fine by me. The front three speakers, though, please do yeah. not use the in-ceiling front three speakers. Please get normal front speakers. Uh, yeah. I have never been as disappointed in a, <laughs> in a surround sound experience as I have when I was in a multi-million dollar house mm -hmm. with a insanely expensive everything like everything was insanely expensive and then all the speakers were in the ceiling and having to hear the sounds and yes i know the voices still kind of anchor themselves to <laughs> that's the, starting the to TV, push it. but that's really it's really hard because it, it was like 12 foot ceilings in there yeah. it was brutal that's starting it to push so the bad. eye ear brain system that tricks us yeah. no no yeah. front speakers don't use the in ceiling surrounds yeah. it's fine uh, and you could use the front left and rights as uh, Atmos f Atmos speakers yeah. for, you know f uh, top front uh, hot front heights or top front fronts. heights yeah doesn't really so. matter what you name them when and if you <laughs> hey and if you depending on how where these speakers are placed on your ceiling you could use the other ones as your top middles yeah yeah, well, and the rears, speakers you the could ground. have top fronts and top rears at most. You've already got in ceilings, and then you get five floor level right. speakers. You could also do that, yeah. have a nine speaker. That, that would be probably the optimal way to use <laughs> these speakers. All right, Aaron. Aaron says, Thanks for talking to his wife, Tom. I don't know what you're talking about. I haven't <laughs> spoken to your wife. Yeah. You, mean? you. Doesn't sound like me. I don't talk to other people's wives. Yeah. I actually don't. Like, I get real yeah. super weird about when. There's, I don't know. <laughs> socially, socially, I find it awkward to talk to a man's wife in front of him unless I'm like f specifically friends with her and then I don't really know him. But that's weird. All right. They still haven't decided whether to get the 77 inch OLED and move the seats closer or to put the seats where his wife says she wants them and go with the projector. But if he goes with an, 
If he gets an OLED, the price on Sony's 2019 A9G has now dropped uh, as low as $3,500. That's $200 cheaper than the LG uh, CX that he was looking at. So what does the LG offer over the Sony that might make it worth a couple hundred dollars more? Well, like you can totally sh turn the lights on and still see the TV. <laughs> That's like number one right there. Um, yeah, it's not that different on that front. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> they both know, depending it. on how. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a with a direct view. Uh, well, no, no, this is a OLED versus a OLED. OLED versus OLED. Sorry, yeah. I thought I, I read that incorrectly. Okay. I read that as a projector. Um, in the A nine G is a one of the LCDs, or it's not an OLED, is no, it? No, that is an OLED. Yeah, that was that oh. was Sony's top of the line twenty nineteen OLED was the A nine G. Uh, and then, of course, this year, the C10 is the most popular of LG's OLEDs. Um, so the difference is like there. Could, okay, is there a difference? And I think that the LG is better. But go on. <laughs> yeah. So the <laughs> LG has four HDMI 2.1 inputs. Uh, they are limited to 40 gigabits per second, but it's not a big deal. That limits you to 10 bits instead of 12 bits. And the panel is 10 bits anyway. So you get four HDMI 2.1 inputs on the LG C10. You get zero on the Sony. So if you are looking towards next generation gaming, PlayStation 5, Xbox Series X, uh, NVIDIA 30 series graphics cards, or the new AMD 6000 series graphics cards, any of those, then uh, in fact, you could plug all four of those simultaneously into an LG C10 and uh, zero of them into the Sony and glean all the HDMI 2.1 features. Uh, the other thing is the dynamic tone mapping. Uh, now, both have dynamic tone mapping, uh, but in the Sony, you cannot turn theirs off it is always present, and Sony opts to keep the overall average light level at a sort of the same, but they are willing to sacrifice the brightest highlights. They're willing to let those just blow out into pure white uh, to maintain the average picture level. That's just the approach Sony takes to uh, HDR tone mapping in general. Whereas LG, you have the option of turning dynamic tone mapping on or off, and when they do it, they favor preserving all the highlight detail. Occasionally, that means the image looks a bit dimmer, because everything got smushed down so that you could keep the brightest highlights, but it's just their differing approaches in tone mapping. So those are really the two things you would look for, HDMI 2.1 and how they handle dynamic tone mapping. Okay. Uh, Aaron has a compliment of clip speakers that he got for a steal of a price. He was initially planning to use the bookshelf speakers as surround, but the room isn't very large and saving space would be a plus. He saw that Rob has experience with the uh, Ravel M8 and M10 on wall speakers. Would they be a suitable choice or is there a better option that won't protrude from the walls? Uh, I don't know. I'm... I, I got I to gotta get some more water. So Okie doke. Well, I'm going to say to go with uh, Klipsch because you already got Klipsch. Uh, Klipsch has reference premiere on wall speakers. Um, they actually are very nice. They sound very good. They do not protrude from the wall very much at all. They're about three and a quarter inches in depth from front to back. And uh, yeah, $250 each, I think, but uh, that's basically the same price as the Revel M8s. Uh, the Revel M8s, I, in my opinion, are overpriced at their retail price. Um, they are really, really base shy. Uh, there's like nothing below 120 hertz on them. Uh, they cannot play particularly loud. They sound quite decent. Uh, one of the reasons I like the Revel M10s is that they actually have a center version of the M10 that does things right. It doesn't have horrible comb filtering like most on-wall speakers that are just laid horizontally do. Uh, but in your case, since you're already going with Klipsch, uh, go with the Klipsch Reference Premiere on walls. Uh, they will perfectly match in aesthetics, in sound quality, and the price is the same anyway. So there you go. Okay. R what just happened? I don't know. <laughs> I don't either. <laughs> no, I just lost. Okay. Uh, it was Rob X, right? It is Rob X, yes. Okay, hold on. You Something. keep fiddling with things over there. I don't no, know. No, no, I am fiddling with things, but it just it just spun me off the page, off the, 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 the list that I was on. Uh -huh. our, our list. Okay, hold on. I'm scrolling. I'm uh -huh. scrolling. Rob X, there he is, right there. <laughs> He says, what are, let me just zoom in here. What are the officially certified ultra HDMI, uh, ultra high speed HDMI cables for uh, HDMI 2.1 and 48 gigabits per second? Where are they? Uh, gigabits per second. He heard Rob say that mono prices ultra H, 
8K high-speed cables were unofficially tested mm -hmm. and only up to three feet, but they got they but they list a dynamic view Ultra HK Ultra 8K <laughs> cable with 48 gigabits per second. That's as long as eight feet. Are those not okay? Audio Quest mm -hmm. is advertising 48 gigabits per second HMI cables that they guarantee will work. But they start at two hundred dollars because you the Audio Quest, That's of course. Right. He just wants to know for certain that when it co he connects his Xbox Series X to his LG CX OLED, that the 4K 120 is gonna work. Uh, for not Audio Quest, <laughs> don't yeah, don't don't support don't, Audio don't, Quest. Don't that support. is I, that is the that snake is oil ludicrous. of all snake oil. They almost well, put they're not Monster as bad as some. I mean, they are bad. I'm they're not gonna bad. say they're not bad, but they're not like the worst out there but the uh <laughs> you definitely don't want to support companies that have the kind of business practices that they have um that said uh, in this case i would always 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 buy from someplace i can easily return to yeah <laughs> because yeah because that's definitely what you want to be able to do so to mention the bit about the monoprice ones um they do have the dynamic view uh they do go as long as eight feet those are an active HDMI cables. So there's a, a little chip in there that draws power from the display device uh, to boost the strength of the C signal that's going through the HDMI cable. I don't feel completely confident um, in recommending an active HDMI cable right now until it is fully officially certified. Um, because if there are any issues with any of the way that the chip boosts the signal or something like that. I just, I don't feel super confident. If it's a passive cable and, you know, even unofficial testing, they've managed to send through 48 gigabits per second. The chances that a passive cable is somehow not going to work, very, very low. But with an active cable, I'm not entirely confident. So that's the reason I didn't mention the dynamic views, because they are an active chip drawing power design. Um, so I know of two companies that have received official uh, certification. The correct name is Ultra High Speed HDMI Cable. If they stick anything else in there like Ultra 8K or Ultra HD or whatever, anything other than Ultra High Speed HDMI, uh, then it is not fully certified. So uh, JCE, which is a company in Taiwan, they were the first. They got some cables that were certified as long as 15 feet, uh, but I haven't been able to find where to actually purchase them. I have no idea where they are sold or if they're sold under some other brand name and they're just the OEM. Uh, Vincent Teo over at HDTV Test, he mentioned some cables that he found in the UK that are not officially certified, but he tested them with his uh, NVIDIA graphics card and they worked. They passed through the full uh, bandwidth and they functioned. So you can, I'll have a link to his video where you can see those ones. But there is one that you can buy uh, from Amazon.com. It is a company called Vivify. Uh, it is the W31. This is a passive cable. It is only available in a 6.5 foot length. There is no other length that is officially certified yet. Just 6.5 feet. So I hope that's as long as you need. Uh, but yes, the Vivify W31 HDMI cable is available from Amazon.com. The 6.5 foot length is $15. So it's not like they're grossly overcharging. It's certainly not the $200 that AudioQuest wants. Uh, so yeah, that, that one is HDMI LLC themselves tweeted out, here's an officially certified cable. So that's as official as it can get right now. There you go. Yeah, I, I really feel like uh, I don't know how they're going to make passive cables anymore <laughs> ah. with what they've what they're trying to what kind of bandwidth they're trying to push through. Yeah. I just don't see it, especially at any sort of length. There's just not. It just doesn't work. Six feet. That it's way. looking like you know six feet yeah. is like the thing. Uh, uh, HDMI LLC did mention that Vivify also received official certification for a 15 foot fiber optic. HDMI cable that they're charging two hundred dollars for and is not available to purchase yet. So I mean, fifteen feet for two hundred bucks. Whoo! That's that's a, that's a but you know, Mon a Mono Price has fiber optic ones uh, that they say again not officially certified yet, but they have a fiber optic one starts at ten feet, and the ten foot one is one hundred ninety dollars for Mono Price. So it seems like this is what we're looking at for anything over six point five feet. All right, uh, Jason, 
Jason first put together his theater in 2011 in uh, a 7.1 setup with all paradigm monitor V7 speakers, tower center and dipole surrounds and backs, a 58 inch Panasonic plasma and a, that's nice, and a Denon 3300, uh, 3311 receiver. Now he has upgraded to a 65 inch uh, LG C8 OLED and a Denon X4500H. So he's thinking about that most. Mm -hmm. His basement room is 12 and a half wide by 18 long, but it only has six foot seven inch ceil uh, ceilings. Mm -hmm. He's put his two rows of, uh, he's put two rows, three seats each with uh, the back row on a uh, riser. His dipole surrounds and backs are elevated so that they have a clear line of sight. So with his low ceiling, they're only about a foot down. Mm -hmm. So what are our thoughts on adding one or two pairs of in-ceiling Atmos speakers? Would it improve the immersion effect at all? Or maybe it would actually make things worse? Do we think he should add Atmos speakers or not? So let me take a little closer look here. Yeah. yeah this, you know, this, this room uh, is not unlike, you know, kind of my room. Your surround speakers are a little bit higher than mine were before I lowered them because <laughs> I because they were they were too high and I lowered them down um, and I had dipole bipole speakers that I could yeah. switch between uh, and then I got the the uh, prime surround whatever they're called prime, prime satellite satellite speakers um, which I actually laid on their side so that their tweeter would be even lower <laughs> just trying to mm -hmm. just trying to get them you know as low as possible but uh, so <laughs> the, the the thing to, the thing that you would normally suggest to do in this case would be to do uh top fronts top rears where they mm -hmm. the top fronts are a little bit you know kind of where they're supposed to be for your uh, uh front row your of main front your main row of seats since yeah, he's got a low rows. ceiling that might only be about three and a half feet in front of him right in this instance and just then the, for the angle the, if it were me I'd put the 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 surround the top rears basically above the heads of the people in the back row yeah. maybe a little bit squished behind that seat but that puts them like within spitting distance of not even, i mean they could reach out and touch the surround backs i'd, I'd basically have the like. top rears like straight up and just to the outsides of the mm. back row of seats and then yeah top fronts uh just slightly in front of the front row maybe about three three and a half feet um <sighs> like i'm not gung-ho either way i i yeah. don't really think you'd be getting a ton out of adding atmos speakers if you did i don't think it would ruin anything it might enhance something here or there a little bit um, his speakers are already so high up i just don't see I that he's going to get that much that much like height information. Yeah. Um, like, if, for if example, you... if you were saying, should I make sure that I buy an 11 channel receiver to do Atmos? Yeah. I'd be like, no, uh, I wouldn't. But since you have one already and Atmos speakers don't need to be expensive, you can get some inexpensive, nice in ceiling speakers from Monoprice with, with back cans, you know, all for a very reasonable price. And if you want to do the project, you could put them up there. So I'm like, I'm, I'm come see, come saw, you know, like I don't think you have to spend a ton Busting of money. out the French. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you have to spend a ton of money to put them up there. And if you did, uh, you might enjoy them here or there and it won't ruin anything. If you didn't, I'd be like, yeah, it's also fine to just leave things the way they are. <laughs> yeah. What about going with uh, top middles front heights? Because that would put his speakers as far. Now you would ignore your back row. Yeah. Yeah. And I. I, I mean, everything's would... so close in here. I wouldn't bother with that. I. Yeah. I do uh, right above the back row and slightly in front of the front row. That's yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Brandon. First off, Brandon says he started listening to us about a year ago. He's a member of the Two Hour Plus Club, and thanks to us, he's learned about Carl's Place for his outdoor screen that he has paired with an Epson 3800 and also the Monoprice HDMI audio extractor that allowed him to use his HDMI sources with his Sonos Beam. So his question is, he is building a home theater in his basement as part of a larger renovation. Don't do your kitchen. The electrical wiring for his house will be updated, so now is the time to plan for any changes in the home theater room. At present, there are two 15-amp circuits dedicated to the theater room, one for outlets and one for lighting. He would like to end up with a 7.2.4 surround system and some controllable lighting. What we recommend in way of electrical for the theater. So he didn't tell us how big the room is. 
in which I guess would be the only thing that would make me think you might need like 20 amp circuits. Ah. I mean, you could you could do that if you were like, oh, I might put some massive mono blocks in here and I need, you know, two power cords for each one of them or whatever. <laughs> then you also have to run 12 gauge wire. Yeah. I, so yeah. I don't, you know, I don't, right now your plan sounds just fine. You're mm -hmm. separating the lights out from the the wall outlets, which is great. The rest of the electrical. So that way, if you do put something on a dimmer or you do put something, mm -hmm. uh, you won't get that weird. Uh, or if, like, what I've also seen is you turn the lights on and you hear a pop from sure. your, like, <laughs> receiver or whatever. That won't happen. Mm -hmm. So that's great. Uh, other than that, I would just make sure you have tons of outlets, like, everywhere. Like, I was thinking outlets. an argument could be made, since it's pretty simple, and they're going to be doing wiring in this basement anyway, to get... Uh, like one more breaker because a breaker will have two 15 amp uh, breakers on it, right? Like the little thing that you plug into your electrical panel that have two 15 amps on there. Uh, so it sounds like, you know, he has one of those already dedicated to this room. So you can, one of the 15 amp lines is for his lighting, the other for the regular outlets that are spaced around his walls. I'm like, I could make the argument for putting in one more of those. So you have two more 15 amp lines. Uh, you can have one that goes directly to where your gear, whether you're gonna have a rack or everything's gonna be on a TV stand at the front. Like one goes there, it's gonna power all your gear. You know, all your gears, go the majority of your gear is gonna live together either in a rack or a TV stand. One outlet for that. And maybe you have another outlet that you put like, you know, four wall outlets around the room where four subwoofers might live, you know, <laughs> like you just, that way you can kind of separate all your uh, home theater equipment from the remaining outlets where you're just going to plug in normal day-to-day -day things and the lighting. The lighting definitely keeps separate, but you've already got that in hand. Right. So because it's not super expensive and it gives you just that little bit extra separation and peace of mind, you know, maybe you get one more little uh, 215 amp breaker, put that in your electrical panel and run that to your theater. That, that'd be about it. I wouldn't do anything more than that. And even that isn't entirely necessary. It's just kind of a nicety. Right. I think I've got like, where I knew I was going to plug my gear in, I think I've got six outlets back there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just in case. It's all yeah. in the same circuit, but just yeah. in case. Yeah. You know, uh, so, you know, in, in, when you know you're going to put some gear, you're like, I'm going to put a subwoofer, or I want to have the option of putting subwoofers in these locations. Just make sure you have an exactly. outlet there. Yeah. This would be good. Uh, all right. So, Brandon. Brandon is under the impression that we prefer wireless Bluetooth outdoor speakers, but he wants outdoor speakers that are mounted and wired. I prefer them. I don't know that Rob has a preference, but I do. But well, here we go. <laughs> he already has a pair of Death Tech uh, AW6500, which are $500 a pair for one outdoor zone. Is it important to match what he already has for a different outdoor area? He was considering then NHT02 ARC. ARC. 410 a pair at Amazon or a Polk Atrium 6 to 30 a pair at Amazon. What do we suggest? We always suggest Yamaha. We do. And I see I see absolutely no reason for you to try to timbre match your outdoor speakers. No. I, I mean, mean there's separate zones in, even. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't know what he means by separate zone either. I mean, if it's like this is one side of the pergola and this is the other side of the pergola mm. and the pergola is not that big, then that's kind of the same zone to me. I guess but so. It, it, you know, but if it's like this is the front of the house, this is the back of the right. house. Dude, yeah, no. Or this is the swimming pool area, and this is the tennis courts. I don't know, Brandon, how much, <laughs> how big of a compound you have for your little weird cult you've got going on over there. <laughs> wow, that I, I, I that just escalated that quickly. Escalated very quickly. <laughs> but yes, I would point you to uh, Yamaha's uh, AW five nine two. That is their six and a half inch model with the wedge design that I prefer. I like the yeah. Yamahas that have the wedge design. Uh, those are their all weather speakers. Two hundred and fifty dollars for a pair of those at Amazon right now. So I mean, barely more expensive than the Polks. I don't personally really like the Polks, so I wouldn't point you that way. Um, these are barely more expensive. I, I heartily recommend the Yamahas, and why spend more? Two hundred fifty bucks right. for a pair. So, what four conductor speaker wire do we recommend for outdoor installations? Uh, the stuff that's rated for outdoor installation yeah. is uh, for four conductor speaker wire. So is he, is he with it like, okay, so when I think of four conductor wire, you take, they usually have like, like red, green, yeah. you know, black, blue or something like that. And you take two of them, you twist them together and that makes one speaker basically. You can either one. do that or it might just be that he's like, just wants to run one thicker wire 
out. Maybe it's right. going to go to the middle of the backyard, and then he can split off the two sides, and you know, one goes. I don't six think you can do that way. with. I don't think you can you do that with outdoor wire. I think I, I thought the jacket was part of it, so I didn't well, think that you could do that. The unless jacket you is through conduit. Part of it for the direct burial part of it. Uh, right. If you're going direct burial wire, then you need the outer jacket. But outside of the outer jacket, then it's just speaker wire. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah, again, since we were already shopping at Amazon, there's a company called Gear It. I never heard of them before, but it's copper wire, 16 gauge, four leads. They also have 14 gauge, four leads. Uh, you can get uh, 100 feet of it for 60 bucks if it's the 16 gauge or $80 if it's the 14 gauge. Uh, if you need 250 feet, it's only $140 for the 16 gauge or $210 for 250 feet of the 14 gauge. So, I mean, yeah, that was one of the least expensive. It is outdoor, direct burial rated. Uh, there's not really much reason to go beyond 16 gauge for outdoor speakers. And it's nice and affordable, and you can just order it at Amazon. All right. Uh, Ralph. Ralph asks, can we recommend an app for cataloging his Blu-ray collection? No, I cannot. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Next question. Well, I can give it a shot. Uh, the one I've been using is called My Movies. Now, this is a little bit confusing because there's another one called My Movies with a longer name. Uh, but MyMovies.dk is the actual website. Um you can download the regular version for Windows or Mac. Uh, I think that one is for free, but if you want to use it on your phone uh, and be able to catalog more than 50 titles, because the free version is basically just a trial and it tops out at only 50 titles, it's $10 for the app, uh, which... Um so that's my movies app. It's my movies pro on iPhone or Android for ten dollars, uh, and some really nice features in there. Um, you can scan barcodes with your phone, and it will automatically. Uh, look up in the database uh, via the barcode. So that can be handy if you're at a store and like, do I already own this movie? <laughs> you just scan the barcode and be like, yeah, here it is in your collection. Um, the other thing is that if you are trying to integrate it with a home theater PC, uh, My Movies integrates well. You can do all sorts of things where My Movies will actually point to the file on your network attached storage or something like that. And uh, you can mm -hmm. integrate all of that stuff together and use their metadata uh, to organize things. So that's what you'd be getting for the ten dollar price my movies pro now the free one that most people like is uh the website blu-ray.com that catalogs every disc that gets announced and comes out uh it you have to register with them so you'd have to go to blu-ray.com and register but registration is free so you're just getting an account with them so you can post on their forums and have an account over there doesn't cost you anything and they have an app called my movies by blu-ray.com so don't get it mixed up with the other My Movies Pro, but the full name, My Movies, by Blu-ray.com. It is a free app. You just have to be registered with Blu-ray.com and registration is free. So if you just want a catalog, that's a great choice. Uh, DVD Profiler is another program that's been out there for ages. Uh, most people have kind of moved away from it, but uh, it's $3 if you want to check that one out. So not a huge price on that one. I'd probably go with one of the My Movies options. All right. Well, I the my Blu-ray cataloging uh, <laughs> system is I go to my middle son and I say put those in alphabetical order, <laughs> but separate the Ultra HD Blu-rays out from the Blu-rays. Ah. And if there's an Ultra HD Blu-ray, and then there's Blu-rays that are associated with it, like the Avenger <laughs> movies, they all get put together. Ah. And you have to yep. make sure. And he's like, "Well, that doesn't make any sense." Well, where, where do I put them? The Blu-ray or Ultra Blu-ray? I'm like, yes. <laughs> because life is full of uncertainty and i'd like to you need to be able to think on your feet boy so yeah all right scott scott has a vi vpi turntable with a kotsu kotsu moving coil cartridge they're both about 19 years old now and he hasn't used them in a long time but he's getting back into vinyl in a pretty big way and when he quickly tried it out to see if it still functions it seems to sound fine but what would we recommend if he wants to have the best audio quality should he replace or service the moving coil cartridge to have the very best audio quality you should buy the cd but um <laughs> you don't want to do that and i'll be honest with you i think in my entire life i have touched a record player a about half a dozen times and none of them were mine uh or owned by my oh no that's not true my parents had one for a little while i don't mm. know what happened to it but uh yeah i i literally have no knowledge of 
vinyl in any of the stuff. So, I mean, the times I've seen people interact with vinyl and they know they talk about the cartridges and all the other stuff mm-hmm. and the needles. The needles seem to be the thing that people worry about a well, lot. Sure. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing yeah. that physically makes contact uh, will physically wear out if you allow the needle to, uh, you know, become dirty or damaged. Then it can start to damage your records, which right. uh, you obviously. So I've don't seen people do. clean the records a lot. You know, oh, making yes. sure the records are clean before they do this, and that seems to make a difference to them. But uh, I mean, if it, if you just took it out after 19 years and played it, and it still sounded pretty good, I I would you know take it to somebody and maybe do an overhaul on it or something yeah i mean the thing is you know happily for vinyl fans these days uh it, it has grown enough in popularity that there are multiple uh you know vinyl turntable uh repair shops and service centers uh, in in most places if you're anywhere near a large city there's going to be a shop that uh, that deals in servicing turntables so i i would look that up i'd look up local shops um and records i mean if you just want peace of mind just have taking it in even just to have it properly thoroughly cleaned if it's been in storage for 19 years it, it could likely benefit uh from just a cleaning and a tuning maybe a rebalancing of your tone arm you know those types of things if you don't want to take that on yourself uh there, right. there are service shops all over the place now for me um you know if if i just wanted to do this i would probably just purchase a new cartridge with a needle already installed and i i wouldn't personally deal with with the really finicky part of it um that that's sort of how i, I would approach it personally but if it's not broken, there's no real reason why that needs to be the case. And and like I say, just having it, just taking it into a to a, a turntable shop, um, a hi-fi store, uh, I, I think uh, would give you the peace of mind and get it nicely cleaned and balanced and all ship shape. Jeff, Jeff has an open floor plan and a 25 foot vaulted ceiling. He says the house itself is medium sized, but it's all open concept. Mm. He's got a pair of HSU uh, VTF3 Mark V subs. VTF3 okay. Yeah, so it's one step are, down from the flagship uh, VTF 15H Mark yeah, II. And they're, yeah. they're handling the bass very nicely, but his monitor uh, audio bronze series speakers seem to be struggling to keep up. He's got uh, BXT towers, twin five and a quarter inch woofers, and the matching center and surrounds. They're all crossed over 80 hertz using his Onkyo RZ810 receiver. So what should he do? Would getting uh, monitor audio monitors uh, models with bigger drivers make any difference if they are also crossed over 80 hertz? Should he get an amp? Uh, <laughs> where are you sitting in relation to these speakers? Because that's the number one thing we care about. If you are sitting, I mean, are you sitting on the, if you're sitting on the ceiling and they're on the ground, well, then you're too far away and you need different speakers and getting bigger drivers will not help you. But uh, I assume that's not the case. So, how far away are you sitting from your speakers? Because if you're over 12 feet, uh, if you're like sure. 20 feet away, then, you know, it's like it not the size. seems like maybe he's just kind of filling up his whole house with sound and, uh, yeah. you know, walk, walking around this open concept and could be many, many feet away from it at times and is just finding that they're struggling a lot. Now, these particular monitor audio bronze um, speakers that he has, they're they're – relatively efficient they're 89 db one watt one meter uh but they don't have tremendously high power handling um you know recommended to to sort of keep it to about 120 140 watts uh if it's continuous so they're not like massive output beasts you know they're they're a pretty average um sensitivity and then not crazy high power handling so honestly if if you're driving them as two channel your your onkyo is already uh providing basically as much wattage as they're, um, you know, prepared to take on a continuous basis. So I'm thinking for what he's described, putting the pieces together, reading between the lines, some more efficient speakers are, are really yeah. the way to go here. I, I see. I, I agree with you. I, I see two possible solutions here. Okay. And the first solution is that what you're going to suggest, which is more efficient speakers mm-hmm. so that you can put more power into a, um, or get the, put the same amount of power that you're already putting into the, your current speakers and get more volume out. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but I think 
what he really needs is a second option and that option is a zone two which is whole sure. house audio whole house audio yeah start distributing so, the the source of the sound instead of asking right. one pair of speakers to fill up an entire open concept and and i think that's what i would suggest okay. i would suggest that you have you keep your monitor audio bronze speakers and your two sub or however many subwoofers he's got and you know for your dedicated you know listening or whatever and then when you're, you know, when you want to just have music in the background, you, you know, put speakers in all the rooms, mm -hmm. you know, all the rooms that you're going to worry about the in ceilings, bookshelves or whatever, however you, you need to do it, or even wireless with some of the wireless solutions mm -hmm. that are out there. And then that there, that way you get sound in all of the rooms of your, uh, that you're looking for. And then you're not trying to change up just, you know, these two speakers that you have. Mm hmm that I assume that you like not changing those up in order to so that you can get the sound from you know one corner of the house all the way to the other you just say okay now I'm I'm no longer listening with those speakers I'm listening with you know we're doing the whole house audio thing and I think that's to me I think that's the solution now we just have to be able to make sure that he can still use the subs uh, in right. that solution, yeah, you'd have to make the... sure whatever zone they're assigned is always on, because they'll be right. they'll basically be producing the bass for all of the speakers, all no matter it. what right. zones they are. Um, but if, uh, like, I agree with Tom, I, I think if, if that is the scenario, it's just that this is playing throughout the entire house, and you want better, uh, more even coverage, then yes, uh, multi whole house, multi zone whole house audio is the solution there. But if this is a scenario where he's like, nope, these are the only pair of speakers that are going to be playing, and this is what I'm dealing with. I just need them to be able to play considerably louder than they can right now. Um, like I say, my first thought is you get more efficient speakers. Now, of course, you can look at Klipsch. Uh, you can look look at some uh, reference Premiere, which are a pretty darn nice price point that's comparable to the monitor audio bronze that you already have right now. And aesthetics-wise, Klipsch is probably going to be one of the nicer options. Uh, since you already are familiar with Shu with HSU for their subwoofers, they do have their HC1, uh, which is like listed as a center speaker, but you can turn it vertically. It says right, so right in the manual, you can turn it vertically and use it as a dual woofer, uh, single horn loaded tweeter design. Uh, and it is available in a uh, uh, rosewood finish if you don't want just basic black. Now the other very, very high efficiency speakers uh, that I'm about to mention are ugly as all get out <laughs> so if aesthetics I clicked are on concerned them and he is not he is being kind to these speakers yeah uh I, I, that he is being kind power sound audio is the first one uh 775 for their their smallest model going up to 975 for their dual woofer horn tweeter model all the way up to 1175 and these are all each so double this yeah. price for a pair uh for the tower version uh but yeah big black plain and i mean when i say big big they were 10 inch <laughs> woofers in there uh so these are not oh my small. god those are 10 inch woofers are, are you kidding me woofers. yeah <laughs> oh my god and then the king, no wonder they're so expensive <laughs> the king of efficiency is jtr uh jtr's yeah. smallest speakers so these use compression tweeters uh not just horns they are like approaching 100 decibel <laughs> per one watt one meter uh, efficiency a thousand dollars is their cheapest that's their 10 inch with a compression tweeter mounted inside of it uh those you know go all the way up to you know 2800 dollars each if you're looking at the uh the tower um offering from jtr so that's one way to come at it uh, if you are like, I want monitor audio and nothing, but they do have larger tower models that are more efficient and capable of handling more power, uh, you'd basically need to do both. You'd need to both get the larger model and get an amplifier to really maximize right. what's going on there. So that is not... Which suddenly makes that, those power sound audio ones not that exactly. expensive when you start thinking about yeah. go, getting an amplifier in order to stick with monitor audio. And so. as far as still crossing them over at 80 hertz, absolutely. Because it, the speaker is still responsible for... I mean, it is still playing down to 40 hertz. It's a roll-off, not a brick wall. Right. So it's still playing right. sound from 40 hertz. And then, you know, the subwoofer is rolling off uh, up at 160. So, I mean, there's there's a tremendous amount of bass that's still being produced by the speaker itself. So it's not as though you're wasting the capability of the larger speaker by crossing it over at 80 hertz or something like that. Uh, it, it can make a difference because the larger model is more efficient and can handle uh, essentially twice as much power. So that's 
but that's why you need to get both to make the monitor audio uh, version. And it, it, it still won't get you the type of output that any of these horn loaded or compression uh, right. driver ones will. How are they crossing that comp- that tweeter into a 10 inch driver? It's just. Well, over at JTR, they're doing it into 15 inch woofers, you know? So that's just insane. 12 or 15 that, inch woofers. That's just nuts. I don't know how they're doing that <laughs> without getting all sorts of, you know, cone distortion as they're getting to that crossover. Yeah, uh, it's all so. about the horn, man. Yeah. All right. Well, good luck. Mm. Oh, and if you want. Uh, suggestions for i mean because if you decide that you want to go with the whole house audio thing right then suddenly you know your speak your speaker options become you know way different way yeah. easier to do if you don't need something that's horn loaded because they're going to be there's going to be more of them so right. you can buy cheaper ones you know a couple hundred dollars a piece for mono price or one of the many other places or just get you know prime satellite speakers uh and put them kind of well actually since you know, onkyo in- supports so many different uh wireless um, solutions, yeah. including... Heos, right? Uh, well, no, Heos is Denon. Not, not Heos, uh, PlayFi. Yeah, PlayFi, DTS know, PlayFi. But... I mean, you could actually go with like uh, SVS's Prime Wireless speakers because they are right. also DTS PlayFi. They would work right away, out of the box, with your Onkyo receiver. Uh, so that's one yeah. option. They're also, uh, what is it, Flare Connect or Fire Connect, whatever the name is these days, right, uh, right, also right, works right. with that. So yeah, there, there's certainly options to do wireless whole house if you want to with your Onkyo. Alan. Alan is in the middle of, a, of house renovations, and he is finally going to have an enclosed room to use as a dedicated theater. Don't do your kitchen. But it is very small, 12, uh, 12 foot 8 inches by 9 feet, and the ceiling is sloped. If you're looking at one of the 9 feet foot walls, which has a window in it, it is 7 and a half feet tall. Then the opposite 9 foot wall is 8 feet 10 inches, and that was that's the interest that has a door towards the right-hand side of your facing the window okay he has an older benq w1070 projector and some screen material from cinemark uh from a cinemark theater where he used to be a manager perforated acoustically transparent but he figures that with a room this small a projection setup probably doesn't make sense he's thinking he'll use his 65 inch vizio p series for now and upgrade to a 77 inch oled when he's saved up the speakers he has on hand are energy reference connoisseur rc 70 towers and an uh, LCR Center plus a pair of Andrew Jones Pioneer Andrew Jones bookshelves for surrounds. He has an SVS PB12 NSC subwoofer and, and just upgraded to a Denon X3600H receiver. Frankenstein system, boy, <laughs> I'm feeling you. That's my kind of system. All pretty darn decent stuff there, though. There's, there's yeah, there's nothing. There's not a bad. There's not a bad choice in there. It's right. just that you know, you know, it's, you, it's a Frankenstein system. That's where we all kind of <laughs> start, you know. And uh, yeah, I, I totally agree with that. You they should not. Just take that Cinemark perforated stuff and get rid of it. Because, like, God, I wonder how big the perforations are on that. Yeah, thing. that's not <laughs> yeah, really I mean. an appropriate choice for a <laughs> sitting very close. For how to close it. you're going to be sitting yeah. to this thing? Yeah. Plus, who yeah. knows what the gain is on that thing? Usually, the gain in a full size cinema is pretty high. Yeah. So he had in mind that uh, he would face the nine foot wall with the window, making the room nine feet wide and roughly twelve and a half feet long. The door would be at the back uh, on the back wall on the right hand side that this way, and the room would be shorter at the front and taller at the back. He figured he put the couch about seven eight feet from the TV, and that would leave enough room behind him to have surround backs. He wants to run his wires inside the walls before this renovation gets closed up. So, what do we think about the layout? I have a not exactly unorthodox, but a a thought. <laughs> well, you know what I'm going to say about surround backs. Uh, is, we know what Tom is going to say. You right. know what you're going to say about surround backs. So, so uh, let me get this right. He's 12 and a half feet, and he's going to six, six, seven to eight feet away from the TV. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I think that's a perfectly reasonable. The plan. only thing I'm worried uh, about is nine feet wide. How are you getting into your chair? You know, I mean, well, if it's I a, mean, thre- it's got, it's, I mean, it's a, maybe a chair. Well, I, I mean, like <laughs> I mean, he's, he's shown what I assume is a love seat in here, but I'm like, it's still going to be squishy as I'll get out. Like a three seater couch, not a wide three seater couch, a very normal three seater couch is seven feet wide. That leaves you yeah. one foot on either side. How are you going to get into your, so my, well, you do what I do and you sh- slam the thing against the wall <laughs> and then you, you have two feet and then two feet. the middle seat, the, the middle seat is no longer the prime seat. It's right between the middle and the the seat that has you know what I mean? but it, i i i honestly think that he should rotate this entire setup 90 degrees 
I think you should make the room 12 and a half feet wide and nine feet from front to back. I'm good with sitting seven feet from a 77 inch OLED. As we discussed in a previous question, uh, you'll have two feet behind you. Now you don't have surround backs. We're not going to worry about surround backs with that. And, you know, with the room being 12 and a half feet wide instead of long, now you can actually have your surround speakers with a little bit of separation from your seat. They're not going to be like right on top of your seat. And you have a walkway where you can actually get to your seats this way. Right. Um, that, the, that's okay. So the up. The, oh, sorry. The other ugh, hit my hit my mic. Sorry. Uh, so what Rob's talking about is a is a good idea. I, I think that that's a perfectly fine idea. I think it would flip it to the. Well, do you want the left? Do, yeah. Do you want the door in your front right corner or your rear left corner? Because those are your two yeah, options. You, you want in your rear left corner. That's what I think. Okay. So I uh, what this really does is that it opens up Atmos for you. Yes. A lot easier because if you up. just go decide to go for seven point one or seven point whatever, then your surround backs are going to be basically on top of your Atmos yeah. speakers, and we're going to say you know whatever, whatever. This way, you have five point two point four or five point two point six. Uh, either way, it works, and you can have your uh, you know your speakers you know kind of almost you know at that back wall. Mm -hmm you know, up on the ceiling and then in front of you a couple of feet and it, it all, it all sort of works. Yeah. So I think that if it, you know, this, and I, I know I hate having rooms that are wider than they are long. It just feels like wrong to me, <laughs> but uh, I do, I, 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 I will agree with Rob here. It's not just because it kills surround backs, but that does, that does, <laughs> that does sweeten the pot for me. <laughs> And, uh, you know, if you're worried about the window, I mean, the window is going to be on a side wall now. Blackout curtains. And yeah, that's yeah. my, I've got blackout yeah. curtains anyway. So you were you were going to need blackout curtains. Yeah, anyways, that's right. He's going to have his that, that screen in front of the window. Screen originally. in front of it. Yeah. So, so since he has a 3600H, he's thinking about trying Atmos. Would SVS Prime Elevation speakers be overkill? No. The actual roof is only a foot above the slope ceiling. So in-ceiling speakers aren't really an option. He isn't sure what would make the most sense for mounting a Prime Elevations. Put them on the ceiling, even though the ceiling is sloped. Put them in the front and back walls, even though the walls have different heights. Keep the heights of the Prime Elevations the same and have different gaps above them to the ceiling or maybe use the prime uh satellites instead since they have a threaded insert you could use a wall mount that pivots with those okay so since i'm not exactly sure when you look at the slope because we can't really see like how that would work um i what as far as worrying about uh you know keeping them level or not level what you're worried about more than that is the angle mm -hmm. So where you want to have them within the same degrees of each other, if that makes sure. sense. So if you're sitting, if you, if it's, you know, you know, what is it? The 45 degrees, is that kind of like the sweet yeah, spot? Yeah, 45 there, degrees is, is the ideal the elevation angle that Dolby would have you position them. 45 degree elevation. So if you, if you take it where you're sitting and you get a little laser and you, you, <laughs> you put that 45 degrees from where you're sitting and it hits like one spot on the roof on the left. And then the other spot on the roof it hits is actually forward from on the fit you know mm -hmm. forward it will look odd i mean the but thing it is, would be technically right if he goes with the suggestion i gave and rotates this room 90 degrees so it's wider than it is long now uh with the suggestion that you had that the door ends up in your rear left right that's what you figured yeah. was better um yeah. then in now the room will be shorter on the right hand side taller on the left hand side that's the right. way the slope of his ceiling will go now i mean honestly now that the room is only nine feet from front to back i'm kind of like why don't we just mount these things on the front wall and the back wall like that the room's so small at this point that that's right. going to work just fine now yes uh on your left hand side i guess you know, you're going to have a little bit more space between the top of the speaker that is mounted on the front wall and the ceiling because the ceiling is sloping up to your left. But, you know, you're just going to have those at the same height on the front wall, same height on the back wall and angle down towards your seats. So I, I think that's the way that I would personally come at this. Um, I still like the room being wider than it is long in this particular instance because right. we're only dealing with nine feet. And then so I think either either way you I mean I'll say so if you do what Rob's saying mm -hmm. you could use private elevations you could. and that would be fine I think just to be 
to just make your life as easy as possible, I would get the satellites. Mm -hmm. And I would use the threaded inserts with a yeah. mount that is movable so that if you decided once you got the, the room all set up and everything else and you decided, I want the you know, I want the speaker or once you're, you know, because at some point you're going to have to tell somebody where to run a wire mm -hmm. or you're going to have to run it yourself. Either way, it's going to have to get run. Mm -hmm. And at that point, you're going to you're going to say, you know, I, it might be on one. You might decide you went on the ceiling and not on the front walls or in the back walls. I really think that, as far as you know, if you look at the angles, I'm pretty sure you're going to be within. You know, I mean, you could call them top front, uh, front, front heights, heights, rear, rear heights. heights, which actually I prefer to do anyway, just because of the way sounds. So get I mean, I think that 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 would be the easiest way to go, yeah. and it, it actually kind of comes together. It does, honestly. Yeah. Uh, it comes also. Together. I mean, he has a single PB12 NSD right now. Perfectly wonderful yeah. choice for this room size, but I want you to get a second sub. Yes, He's got course. a budget. And I mean, honestly, for your four Atmos speakers, why not save some money? They're, they're, they're just not playing anything so important that they that you need a lot of money spent on those. I, um, I mean... Unfortunately, the Boston acoustics are gone. The uh, Focal birds are all gone. Right. The ones I used to like. But uh, I mentioned how I've I've got a package now that uh, is sort of my go-to for the low price, which is a little bit strangely to get a 5.1 package because it's the only way to get it from Monoprice, the HT35 uh, satellite subwoofer package. Now, the center you're not going to use, the, the little six inch base module you're not going to use but the four satellite speakers in the ht35 from mono price uh the entire 5.1 package is only 160 bucks <laughs> so you're not breaking the bank there and then you get some of the video sec uh ball mounted threaded insert wall mounts uh that give you the option of like mounting it on sort of like an l shape uh threaded insert or just a straightforward that pivots and swivels and everything like that uh i, I would do that because for Basically, what about a two hundred and twenty-five bucks? You've got all four of your Atmos speakers that you can angle and aim in whatever way, and those Monoprice uh, HD thirty-five satellites are perfectly fine as Atmos speakers. So I would save money on the Atmos. That's what I would do in this scenario, and now you can afford to get a second sub, which is way more important. Right. Uh, so the energy towers seem a bit big for such a small room, but he already owns them, and he still has the optional port plug, so he could position them close to any walls. Reference connoisseur bookshelf models can still be found, and he wouldn't mind having matching speakers all around instead of the Pioneer surrounds. He's got $1,200 in hand that he can spend on speakers, but he could potentially sell his energies and Pioneers, although he's not sure how much he'd get for them. Uh, the thought crosses his mind to go all SVS Prime series. What do we think he should do speaker-wise? <sighs> so... The easiest thing to say is stick with what you got mm -hmm. and just see how it all sounds when mm -hmm. you put it together. And I think that's probably what I'm going to suggest you yeah. do. I know that you you want to you want to continue to upgrade and maybe everything. I do know the the desire to go when you've got that Frankenstein system and you're like, I just want to have a matching system. <laughs> I want it to all be timbre match. I want it all. I mean, be I wouldn't be opposed to picking up a pair of the. Uh, energy bookshelf speakers as your surrounds. Now you got five energy reference connoisseur speakers as your floor level. You've got the inexpensive right. monoprice satellites as your four Atmos speakers. And that's it as far as speakers. You're not going to break the bank and you will still have money left in your budget to get the all important second subwoofer. Um, but I, I, I don't, I mean, the energy reference connoisseur fronts that you have really nice speakers. Uh, I, yeah. I don't see any particular reason to, to get rid of those because you probably wouldn't get back what you would hope to get back in terms of selling them used. Um, so I, I would keep them because they're really nice speakers already. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I, I would be okay with that too. Mm -hmm. I mean, as somebody who's been in a small room with towers, I'm sure you're looking to me to say, yes, you should definitely, <laughs> you know, because that's what I did. Mm -hmm. That's what I did. Uh, but you may not have the, the, the issues that I had, which were, right. you know, I didn't have until I got into it. And I've been in my other room in uh, Perth was smaller than this room, but I had fewer issues with uh, imaging and stuff like that than I had with uh, uh, in this room. Mm -hmm. And I'm not really sure why that is. You know, that room acoustics being what they were could have been anything. But uh, I am of the opinion that you, you, you've got to give these guys a chance and just see how yeah. they go and save that money, get that sub, 
then you know at, you know what you got you can't do it all at once because then what are they gonna get you for father's day or your birthday <laughs> or whatever you gotta give some, you gotta give people a chance to get you stuff man yeah. So he he's always really wanted a clean looking setup at the front of his room, just the display and the front speakers and with the gear. But with his initial plan of having his TV on a nine foot wall in front of the window, he figured he needed a TV stand. And it really wouldn't make sense to have a gear rack at the back of the room with an empty TV stand up front. Any ideas? Well, yeah. So Rob already did that for you. If you rotate the room, now you can wall mount yeah. the TV on the wall, super clean look, <clears throat> just a stand for your yeah. center speaker below it, and, and you can you can do what you want, what, what you said you wanted to do. Yeah, so we we do know there's two doors in here, right? No, it's just one Is that door. Right? There's just, it's just, just the one, one door and door. one window. Oh, that's that was, that other thing was a TV. Oh, window, yeah. that's what it was. Yeah, yeah okay. And the window's just going to be so, covered by a curtain um, now. Right. So yeah, you, now you can put your, you can run all your wires to the back of your room, you put your your gear you know in the back there or something like that and have that nice little clean look that you're looking mm -hmm. for yeah i mean uh i i don't mind having a rack up front i feel i feel like the 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 things the benefits you get from having a, a rack near the front of your room you know, as far as running wires and everything mm. else, you don't have to worry about long HMI yeah. cables. You don't <laughs> HMI two point one. There's going to be your reason for having it yeah. up the front. Yeah. So, if it were me, what I would do is I would have a very low to the ground, you know, uh, you know, very short little stand, and just you know, be very careful about the gear you buy. Mm -hmm. Don't buy a bunch, you know, don't buy a bunch of gear that, you you know, oh, I'm going to have my VHS player still in here because I might one day <laughs> want to want. No, you won't. Stop it. Get rid of it. You know, so you, you get very little, uh, very little stuff. You set your center channel on top of that or near it, you know, inside of it if it's that large. And then you wall mount the, the TV above it. So you get that clean look that you're looking for. And uh, that way you're, you're six and a half foot HDMI 2.1 capable cable uh, actually works and you don't have to buy an active cable for $300. Mm -hmm. So to me, I, I would still put the gear up front. I would just buy something. I would still wall mount the TV. Sure. And I think that gives you the clean look you're looking for. Uh, Bertrand from Quebec City. Oh, I guess Quebec. There's Quebec City. and there is the Quebec is the province, right? Quebec is and the province. Quebec City. Quebec City is in Quebec. <laughs> And I'm saying it wrong because I'm saying qua, right? That's, it's well, ka? I mean, qua is the how you would say it in like the military alphabet. They pronounce it Quebec for the letter Q. So the military alphabet. Who? Who? Which military? My military. Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta. You know, for the alphabet. Oh, when you do the th when oh, you yeah, say well, for that. Q, they they pronounce it Quebec, but yeah. it's Quebec. <laughs> Quebec. All right, I'll try to get it right. I won't, but that was right. Bertrand is back. I didn't know you had left. So welcome back, sir. Uh, and he followed our advice to audition speak other speakers besides B&W. And since he wants a very linear sound similar to his uh, Eddie Modic earphones, he was able to listen to quite a few options. Monitor Audio Silver, Focal Aria, Paradigm Prestige, Clips Reference Premiere, etc. And we were right. B&W is not his top choice. He landed on. Drum roll, please. But, 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 I haven't even read it yet. I really don't know what it is. Calf. No. Martin Logan. What? Martin Logan Motion X series, which are the folded ribbon tweeter models, not electrostatics. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's exciting. That's very exciting. He likes the fast transient response. Can't blame a man for no, that. No, I can't, can't blame a man for liking Martin Logan's. <laughs> Man loves what he likes. So he's also following our Atmos speaker advice. Since soundproofing is a concern, he will opt for on ceiling instead of in ceiling his uh, penciled in SVS Prime Elevation speakers. Since we mentioned them, are they still the right choice? Will mounting them on the ceiling break the soundproofing? And what is the best placement when the uh, front row is the priority and he doesn't actually care that much about the back row? Okay, so we're looking at the picture here. Yeah, he's no, just to explain, rows. there's uh, six oh God, little black circles. So in the ceiling, those are not speakers; those are lights. Uh, lights. Okay. So near the frontmost and rearmost of those little circles, there are some little rectangles labeled Atmos. Um, Atmos. So right. those are the four overhead speaker positions that he's laid out. Now he's clearly sort of like aimed them at his primary seat, which for Atmos speakers you don't need to do; they can just be right. ninety degree yeah. angles and firing straight down. Um, 
That being said, the speakers he's per- he's thinking about purchasing, he might have to angle up the way he's got. Well, to yeah. So, it. so here's the thing. I, uh, in this instance, since he has, so he's done the due diligence. All right, he has gone. Right. He's right. auditioned speakers. He's like, oh, I found not even the ones he expected to like. He expected to like the BMWs best because he was familiar with them from like you know mixing studios and places because lots of places do use BMWs. He's like, oh, I found that. What I like is uh, Martin Logan with the folded ribbon tweeters. Well, they have uh, on-wall mountable um, speakers that are part of the Motion on-wall series. And that's what yeah. I would get. I would get the the little two eyes, the uh, Martin Logan Motion two eyes. On the back of those, they have a threaded insert right in the middle. So you just get one, the video secu mounts with the threaded, uh, the, the threaded rod and the ball joint. And I would mount those on the ceiling with those instead of prime elevation. Let, let's go matching here because the price is not, uh, in fact, the, the two eyes from Martin Logan are a little bit less expensive than the uh, prime elevation. So I would mount those to your ceiling. You can get it with the pivoting ball joint. If you want to angle them, you can. If you want to fire them straight down, you can. Uh, so that's what I would do there. Uh, now, he had another question about will that sort of like destroy his soundproofing, right? Uh, having it mounted on the ceiling. I mean... Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, a a little bit of mechanical transference, of course, but the two eyes are very lightweight. They are going to be going through a ball joint socket. If you really want to, what you can do is just put a little bit of damping uh, in between the ceiling mount and the ceiling itself. It's still going to be secured in there with screws, but if you just put a little bit of like basically rubber tape damping, like plumber's tape damping uh, just in between, that's all you need there. You're not making an actual like hole. You're not using a hole saw and putting a in-ceiling hole. uh, So it's much superior to have it, you know, just this little ball joint thing that's uh, coming down and holding the speaker. Okay. Yeah. A uh, second here. Let me scroll mm-hmm. down. Will in ceiling lights ruin the soundproofing? Anything you can tell us, contractor, regarding those? Yeah. So most in ceiling, it depends on the brand, but you know, or the the model. But most in ceiling lights, uh, especially if you're doing can lights, right. will have just an open back of of some sort, uh, depending on uh, you know what the installation is. Mm-hmm. Is, but if you have lights that are supposed to be mounted so that they are open to the attic, they've got to have some sort of, I mean, they got to be sealed in some way. Uh, right. Is my, my understanding. Um, the, what is typically recommended uh, when you're concerned about soundproofing? So uh, I already know that he's gone to Soundproofing Company because that's going to come up later. So they talk about... Um, their backer box, their soundproof backer box that can be used either for in-ceiling speakers or for can lighting. Now, if you're going to put a soundproofed backer box like that around a light, it needs to be a retrofit light. Uh, It can't be one of the uh, either open back or the ones that disperse a lot of heat because there isn't a ton of space for that heat to go. You'd want to go for a retrofit. I would recommend an LED retrofit uh, because that's going to produce the least amount of excessive heat and it's going to be okay to put that within the soundproof backer box. Now, you can either go with the backer box uh, as it's instructed at, at Soundproofing Company, which is a very overbuilt but very effective soundproofing backer box, or you can go to ISO Store. And ISO Store has ready-made uh, backer boxes that are exactly for this application, but you are going to want the retrofit uh, in-ceiling lights. I'd recommend going LED to keep the um, heat down. And yeah, I'd just yeah, go to yeah. ISO store and get their backer box. I went all LED in my kitchen. Yeah. I just just went all LED. I mean, they're like, oh, it'll last 50,000 hours. I'm like, no, it won't. <laughs> it'll last like three months. They always last three months. It doesn't make any difference. And they make a difference how long, you know, how much you spend on the bulb, it lasts three months. But everything in my kitchen now is LED. And I didn't do it necessarily because, you know, uh, yeah, I I just did it because I I, I wanted to have uh, bulbs that were not screaming hot all the time. Right, <laughs> basically, <Exactly>. you know, <laughs> and because uh, I never a bulb never breaks when it's cold; <laughs> it only breaks when it's hot. He says, "Should you put a surround speakers on shelves or use side clamping wall mounts? What are the pros and cons of each?" Hmm. Well, uh, it's very easy to damp a speaker that is on a shelf. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You, know, you put the shelf in the wall and then you put something between the the, the speaker and the shelf yeah. that damps it 
And now suddenly you're not just limited to this, you know, one mount that you've got. And if you decide later on you want to switch speakers, you just unplug right. it and put a new one on top of the shelf. <laughs> uh, and, you know, you also now, depending on how you set these things up, have a place to put other stuff, yep. you know, whatever that might be. And like, if you, you want to put any, uh, you know, like some two inches of uh, insulation behind the surround speaker, yeah. easier to do with a shelf. I suppose it's... Yeah. Maybe a, a slight tad more difficult to tilt them vertically on a shelf, but it's not really because you can get, you know, just those little foam wedges, which will act as right. both decoupling and an angle. So yeah. uh, I would probably opt for the shelf in your case. You're only talking about two. He wants a five speaker setup, not right. doing surround backs. Tom is a fan of that. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, I would go with shelves. Let's just remember that I have suggested to people that they get surround backs before. I don't know. I know I like to thing as of late. It's a it, I'm a, I've memed myself. Yeah. How did I do that? <laughs> so he plans to get an SVS SB2000 Pro sub. Do we expect Black Friday discounts? Do they give any deals for AV Rent listeners since we were making them so often? No, they don't give any deals. But they guys. do so have their outlet store and they definitely run Black Friday deals. There's no question yeah. that SVS runs Black yeah. Friday deals. I would not be shocked to my core if this if they put year SB two thousand not pro the not pro <laughs> the regular two thousand because we had the NSDs show up yeah the NSDs were like more, wait a second where did you come more from more years than we expected <laughs> now they've replaced the two thousand series with the two thousand pro uh, if there were some Black Friday two thousand series so, now we don't know anything about this we're joking about we, it and no speculating. one's talking about us yeah we we are this is completely speculation but, but I would if it happened bet a lot of money on it. <laughs> Let, let's just say I, I, I would not be I would like, not, shocked out of bed to see that on my no, phone if I looked it up. So, uh, yeah, waiting for Black Friday, not a bad idea at all. Get two. Get two. You want two subs in here, not just one. So how high should he mount his TV and center speaker? The room is r roughly 13 by 15, and he'll uh, be about 7 feet from a 77-inch OLED. Mm -hmm. So... I don't know how high your chair is, <laughs> so that's right. like the number one thing. What you you know the the rule of thumb is that your eye level, and remember it's your seated preferred dis you know prefer a way to watch this your movie resting you're, eye you're, line you're, right. That, uh, th this is yeah. so if you are sitting in a recliner, mm -hmm. it's going to go up a little bit, and you recline back, then it's not you know it, your resting eye is actually aimed up slightly, mm -hmm. you know so. It, it, you know, it, it, that should be about a third from the bottom of the screen. Yes, yeah, yeah. So the easy way to think of it is, yeah, resting eye line. Uh, if you go one third up of the screen's height from the bottom of the screen, that's that's where we would like it to land. Now, in the case of a 77-inch OLED, that's going to basically be a foot above. So you take the bottom edge of the screen, one foot up is one third of that screen's right. height. Uh, 32 centimeters, if you want to be exact. Um, so... Assuming that your resting eye line, like most people's resting eye line in a typical chair, is going to be at about 40 inches. That, that, that's pretty average. 36 to 42 inches is where it tends to fall. So in essence, you should have about two feet, maybe a little bit more than two feet below the bottom of your TV. Um, if you put the bottom of your TV at two feet off the ground, uh, or just a little bit more, maybe 28 inches or something like that, uh, you, you'd be right, right in the butter zone. Hmm. All right. Uh, so he would like to go with a Marantz receiver. Should you get the SR7015 or pay more for the SR8015? <laughs> now, remind me how many... You said he's got five speakers. We want him to get two subwoofers, yeah. but that's immaterial. 5.2.4 uh, is what he's going for. He's going to be going for. So I don't remember what the differences are between the SR70 and the 80. Right. So the 7015 can process 11 speakers but has nine amplifiers built in. So it can run the 5.2.4. The 8015 goes up to processing 13 channels and has 11 amplifiers built into it. You you don't yeah. need either of those need things. That. Now, of course, he's looking at, it's the flagship. It's got the bigger power supply. Gene gave it a very glowing review. Get the 7015. It's a significant <laughs> amount of money. And for the features right. that you're going to use, get the 7015. There's really right. no question. <laughs> Easy one, that one. So he'll have... 
he will have his 77 inch OLED to start, but he would like to leave the option open to have a projector with a motorized roll down screen. Since the room is still under construction, what should he do before the ceiling and walls are all closed up? Are there any special mounting concerns for the motorized screen or can it just be bolted to the ceiling in the future? Uh, so it needs power, yes. but it's not, it's, it's uh, usually low voltage power. Uh, but it depends on the screen you are looking at. So what I would do is, and I'm sure Rob's going to tell you anyways, but if it were me, I would go to, you know, Elite Screens or, you know, Seymour mm -hmm. AV and just look at what the power requirements are. And then I would have something available in, uh, you know, up on the ceiling yeah. near the front of this room so that you would know, you would know that you could necessarily plug something in but you could wire something right like his room is not super long right it's under 15 right. feet long so chances are uh your projector is going to be right on your back wall uh so right. i would have an outlet high up either high up on the back wall or on the ceiling near the back wall so i, I would get that electrical wired there um it would be a good idea to run conduit uh, because there's not much point in running a long HDMI cable right now to where right. the projector is going to be, but run conduit because you're going to want to have with a string in there. Yeah, you're going to want to be <laughs> make sure there's a. String you're going to want to be able to pull cables in the future to the location of your projector. So assume that your projector is going to go high up on your back wall, or maybe it'll be mounted to the ceiling, but essentially at the back of your room. That's that is where it's going to be. So make sure there's electrical and conduit there so that uh, any future cables can be pulled through. And at the front of your room, uh, yeah, have an outlet that's high up on the front wall or on the ceiling on the front wall. Uh, you can definitely mount a motorized um, projection screen to the existing ceiling. It does not have to be recessed. Uh, you could mount right. it to the front wall, in fact, if, if the OLED yes. is thin enough. Uh, but but that, you know, th that you don't have to have special concerns. It's really just that you need an electrical outlet there uh you might might want to run conduit to the projection screen location as well because you might want to run a trigger cable that <laughs> that would be about the only additional uh cable so, that might go to the screen right if you're gonna do that with then what you would because I, I did that in my home mm -hmm. theater uh in jacksonville and what you would want to do is you would want to run it's usually you know like ethernet or something along those lines that uh you run from the where the projector will be mm -hmm. down to a, a wall outlet. Okay. So you, you would, you would need to have that available to you and either know where it is in the wall or, uh, you could actually just have that wire run and have like a blank, a blank plate put on mm -hmm. top of that. And then it would be ready to go for later. Uh, and that's, you know, that's a, that's a really, easy thing for them to do these yeah these guys aren't gonna the other thing i should say is for the outlet that's going to be up high at the back of your room for your projector um oh, right. don't just make it a regular outlet don't run that outlet back to your electrical panel what we really want to do is decide where your equipment is going to live um, I don't know if that's outside of this room or inside of this room, but decide where your equipment is going to live. You're going to want to have a battery backup where your equipment lives. Right. So what you want is a regular female outlet that is high up on your back wall or at the back on your ceiling for your projector that runs to a male inlet outlet that lives near your equipment because that way you right. can plug your projector into your battery backup. That's really what we want to do. So that is important for the outlet. That's the one that's going to, you're going to, you're going to sit there and talk to your electrician yeah. and he's going to look at you like you've lost your mind. I will say. <laughs> it is an in-wall some... extension cord if you need to explain right. it that way. That's what you want. Right. I will say that I have noticed, and I've been to Home Depot so much, that I have noticed that they have started selling those. Uh -huh there yeah. which they well they, Santa's, I, Santa's sells it Santa's has a solution for that they do but you had to special order it for right. for a long time but now they're starting to sell them I saw them just today mm -hmm. I was at Home Depot today and they had them so you know when I hooked up this home theater I had to order mine from Amazon because I went to Lowe's right. and Home Depot and asked and asked around and they looked at me like I had invented something they're like <laughs> what are inlet? you talking about how could that exist <laughs> you know? You know, and I tried to explain to him, and everybody's like, "Nah, that that doesn't exist." I'm like, "It totally <laughs> it does. <definitely> exists. <laughs> it exists." 
So you are lucky in that, it, that they should know what you're talking about now. But yes, Rob's very right. I completely forgot about uh, all the hookups you would need for the projector. Mm. Now, I'll tell you what I did for mine. I did exactly what Rob said. I, there's a man, there's a regular uh, plug up there mm -hmm. behind my projector, male inlet over here, which I then have use a little you know power cord to go to my uh, battery backup mm. for my projector. I ran HDMI up to it, mm -hmm. and then I also ran component video up to it because mm. that's how long ago I plugged the, <laughs> this thing up. And I thought that... If the HDMI went out or if the HDMI cable went bad, I would at least have some way of ah, getting right. video up there yeah. so I could test if it was the HDMI or the projector, you know what I mean? So I had options to kind of figure out what was going on. You may decide to do something along those lines. You may, you know, so that you have that sort of option. Uh, if you run conduit, you're much better yeah. off. I did not run conduit. Yeah, so, so wherever your equipment I... lives, you're going to have conduit that goes from where your equipment lives, definitely to the back of the room where the projector is going to be, possibly to the front of the room so you can run a trigger cable to your screen. That's right. maybe so, maybe not, but because you can do uh, uh, motorized projection screens with just a remote as well, but yeah. possibly. And then regular power, but high up on the front wall for the, uh, for the screen that you might have. And then, um, yeah, basically an in-wall extension cord from a regular outlet to a male inlet that lives near your equipment at the back of the room for your projector. And what I was talking about when we were talking about trigger cables is the projector, uh, this, the motorized screen I had, had a wall a wall control a wall switch, that you sure. could you know, a wall switch you could you could set up and they had like multiple it had multiple settings that you could put on it if i remember correctly so that's why you needed not just a straight 12 volt trigger which is a low voltage nothing you know mm -hmm. cable uh i needed something a little bit with a few more wires in it so he has looked at the floor ceiling and wall construction recommendations as laid out by soundproofing company can he just submit those directly to his contractor and have his contractor follow those for proper soundproofing I'm going to say it, no, <laughs> because I have been working with a lot of contractors. And let me tell you something about contractors, my friend. They're like 12-year-old boys. <laughs> you can tell them to do something, and they can say they're going to do it. But if you don't watch them do it, mm. they're probably not going to do it. I mean, and they're definitely not going to do it the way you wanted them to do that's it. That's basically the reason definitely. why Soundproofing Company came to the whole conclusion of recommending sound clips and hat channels instead of just Resilient Channel, because Resilient yeah. Channel can work. It's just that it has to be installed correctly. And right. very often in the slapdash, let's get this as done as quickly as possible, it is not installed correctly, and you can't really screw up sound clips and hat channels very easily. It's pretty hard to screw that up. So, you know, it's not effectiveness. It's just contractors is why they landed on that uh, again iso store has alternatives that don't cost quite as much um they have their uh i uh, forget what it's called hush hush mount or something like that which is an alternative to sound clip and hat channel uh that costs a little bit less so again you can look at iso store but the uh, the thing that needs to be conveyed to your contractor is the basic approach the four um aspects of soundproofing right. which is right. you know having the insulation in the walls that should be easy enough insulated interior walls that's all and then that, they'll look at you like you lost your mind but yeah, yeah. <laughs> having a way of decoupling the drywall from the regular studs so that's going to be your iso store your sound clips and hat channels two layers of drywall with green glue in between between is fairly self-explanatory but if you do all those four things you'll have very solid soundproofing all right, uh, we have time for one more. So Grinder, Grinder would like to add some velvet to on his ceiling, and some mirrors. Yeah, and on anyway, some velvet on his ceiling on his side walls, all around his projection screen. For the side walls, he had blacked out curtains until now. So would it make sense more sense for the side wall velvet to be curtains, or does it need to be flat and smooth in order to get the best shadow box performance? Um, I mean, the whole point of the black is that it absorbs the light. Mm -hmm. So if it is flat versus wavy, it should still absorb the light and it shouldn't make a considerable I difference. I think what might be happening here is there there is, um, if you just think of velvet, there's the type of velvet that reflects some light. 
right? Like it's right, got that right. little shine to it, the little fibers yeah. that reflects don't, the light. Don't buy that. That you don't want that. <laughs> That's the issue. Yeah, yeah. Um uh yeah. honestly, so Grinder's in Canada, so it's not quite as cheap to do it this way, but like one of the cheapest places to get big rolls of the type of velvet that you do want is from Seymour A V. Um, cause they sell both the Fidelio black velvet, which is expensive and the bolts of it are not that wide. So it's even more expensive when you're talking linear feet of it, get the baritone black velvet, which is a bigger, wider, uh, roll at a lower price. So per linear foot, it's much less expensive to get the baritone black velvet. Now that stuff, whether you have it flat on your wall and see, well, on your ceiling, it's going to be flat, but whether you have it flat on your side walls or you end up making curtains out of it. It's not going to make any difference because that stuff is like, it's a black hole. It doesn't reflect anything. It right. doesn't have that velvety, uh, the thread look that, you know, reflects light sometimes. It's not that type of velvet. It's the it's the black that you want. So what's our opinion on movies that were shot with IMAX sequences only having the cropped 2.35 to 1 aspect ratio for the home release? There was a position a couple of years ago to try to get Disney to release the Marvel movies with their IMAX sequences in the full IMAX aspect ratio, but nothing ever seemed to happen on that front. You mean that Disney didn't listen to people? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I am stunned to silence over Just here. Just subscribe yeah. to Disney yeah. Plus so we can change things whenever we want. This is the version that always existed. The only version. Yeah, the only version with the... <laughs> sequences in star wars that i will never see because i'm never watching mm. it on that ever i still have the vhs version that right? is the original original right i mean i can't watch it <laughs> no way. i don't have a vhs player but i own it and i ain't throwing it away uh so i mean uh, uh, with the way i think yeah. about it i think that uh um i think that when the movie was originally shot mm -hmm. uh I care about what the director was looking at, not what was the native aspect ratio. Okay. So if the director was thinking, you know, this is mostly going to be viewed in a, you know, in a 2.35 to 1 aspect ratio or 16 by 9 or whatever, it's 2.35 to 1. So therefore, I, I care about this bit mm -hmm. and making sure that this bit and if there's other stuff that's in the IMAX version because we have to have an IMAX version that's fine then I want to see the 2.35 to 1 version I don't care that there's an IMAX version out there if they shot it for IMAX mm. with IMAX being the, 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 the point then yes I want to see the IMAX version we will never know because no one will ever tell <laughs> us but yes that that is what would make the decision for me about whether or not I would care about that okay I mean, I I want the original um, aspect ratios. If the aspect ratios switched in the movie, I want that. That that's me. Right. Uh, this is one of the reasons why I, with projection screens, I want sixteen by nine projection screens and not CinemaScope two point three five to one projection screens at home. Uh, that's why I'm in favor of getting the sixteen by nine projection screen because. If the aspect ratio changes, I don't want my screen cropping off the top and bottom. I want to be able to see the entire image. I've always been in favor of that. I like movies like The Dark Knight that switch aspect ratios and give me the larger image. I would love it if they went beyond 16 by 9 and actually had pillar boxes on the left and right so that I could really get the entire IMAX ratio instead of cropping it to 16 by 9 that they do for the home releases. Right. But I'll take 16 by 9 over cropping everything to 2.35 to 1 when the original movie release had things that were shot in actual IMAX. Uh, so that's me. I, I would love to have the IMAX stuff. Uh, if if IMAX Enhanced manages to give us that, then uh, then I'll take all the problems with the manual settings of DTS-X in order to get that part of it. Uh, yeah, that's my take. I, I would prefer to have it that way. Right. So I actually, uh, I was, this came up and like randomly, I was watching the, the, the brand new episode of the Mandalorian. So there's only mm -hmm. one out right now because they release them once a week. And I watched that last night at the very end. They, it, they, they, they slowly cropped it from, right. you know, 16 by nine to, to 2.35 to mm -hmm. one, uh, as a sort of a dramatic choice. Yeah. And if somebody said, wait a second, you just cut a bunch of stuff out. <laughs> Where's the rest of that stuff? I'm like, no, you missed it. You missed the point. The point is, is that this suddenly became, it, it gave it a completely different feel. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I guess that's sort of, you know, 
you know, director's intent is very important to me in this case. Not in all cases, but in this case, uh, director's intent is very is very important yeah. to me. So, all right. Grinder has still has two projectors in this theater, his JVC X790 that he used at 797, whatever, yep. that he uses most of the time, but also his Sony that is strictly used for 3D now. So, never. Uh, he still enjoys 3D from time to time, and the JVC is capable, but you have to buy a, a, a separate emitter and glasses. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, he's read how JVC projectors output 3D with horizontal polarization, and their 3D glasses are also horizontally polarized, so he's asked a loon vision if their screens retain that polarization but they've never been able to supply an answer he's particularly wondering about their acoustically transparent screens so any suggestions for jvc 3d emitter and glasses well no. uh as mentioned grinder is in canada so east porters um is a great retailer for getting projection and uh, screens and that in Canada. Uh, they have the official uh, JVC 3D emitter. Um, there's not much else you can do on the emitter side. You, you pretty much need to get that device. So uh, over at East Porters, you can get that, plug it into the back of your JVC for 130 bucks, which is a little bit steep for nothing but an emitter, but that's what it is. Uh, East Porters also does sell the official JVC 3D glasses that work with that emitter, and they are $170 a pair. Dang. Is, <laughs> well, because nobody's <laughs> buying them anymore. Um, so there was basically um, one company called High Shock. Uh, they're actually out of Germany, but they made 3D glasses. Well, they made 3D glasses for everybody, but they made ones that work with the JVC projectors and the JVC emitters. Uh, prices are in euro, and you're looking at about 67 euro per pair, uh, which even with the conversion not, is considerably less expensive. It's still not cheap. Still though. not cheap, <laughs> uh, but it is less expensive. So that's what you'd be looking at for getting the emitter and the glasses for the JVC now. Uh, the whole polarization thing, that's kind of interesting because if you can retain the polarization, uh, it will look its best, as in you will have the highest contrast and the brightest 3D image if you are able to retain the polarization. Uh, the polarization is inherent to the um, DILA panels that JVC uses. So the panels themselves are inherently horizontally polarized, and that's where that's coming from. Uh, and you will get the highest contrast and the brightest image if you can retain it, but it is not strictly necessary. Uh, these are active shutter glasses, and on a plain white screen, uh, you will still get the 3D effect. It won't be quite as bright, it won't have quite as high contrast, but it will work. It will function on just a regular white screen. So in that sense, you can use any of the AlunaVision um, acoustically transparent screens. Uh, the active shutter glasses will still work and give you the 3D effect. If you do want an acoustically transparent screen that retains polarization, Elite Screens has uh, their, what is it, Aeon Cinegray 3D. Uh, Aeon, Ray. <laughs> Aeon Cinegray 3D retains polarization and is available with perforations to make it acoustically transparent. Uh, but to retain the polarization, it does have to be a silver type of screen. Uh, those are mm. the only ones that will work uh, with polarization to retain it. So like I say, it's, it's not strictly necessary. It'll still function with just a white screen. All right. Who do we have left? We have Nick B, Infinite Gary, Kevin T., Stan L, Chad B, and I'm pretty sure there's one more below Chad's, which is Jack R. That's everybody right. on the list for next week, uh, plus anything that came in Monday and Tuesday. And if you want to get your question answered on this podcast, all you have to do is ask. You ask by emailing us at question at avrant.com. Mm -hmm. We want to thank our listeners of the week. We want to thank Alan, Aras, Kevin, Chad, and Bertrand for going to avrant.com and clicking on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link, as well as our 122 patrons over at patreon.com. Yes, indeed. Alan, Aras, Kevin, Chad, and Bertrand, thank you all so much for those PayPal donations. Really nice to see, and uh, yeah, appreciate it very much. And then patreon.com slash podcast for anyone who'd like to sign up for a voluntary subscription, as little as a dollar a month, if you please, and put as many zeros behind that as you want, because there's no limit uh 122 patrons over there and thank you very much for your financial support 
We really want to thank Steve for helping Rob with his uh, PlayStation VR thing, Blake for talking us up to SVS, and Stan for talking us up to Ascend, and the notes of gratitude from Brandon, uh, Scott, RSJ, and Chad for us keeping the podcast going. Mm-hmm. Steve, thank you for that help on Twitter. It's uh, nice to know that sometimes you just keep doing the same thing over and over, and eventually it works. So yay, hooray, I should have a PlayStation VR camera adapter coming to me at some point in the future. Uh, Blake, congrats on your uh, SVS purchases. Thanks for talking us up directly to Gary Yakubian, the CEO over there at uh, SVS. And Stan, congrats on your Ascend Acoustics purchase. Really nice speakers. I'm sure you'll enjoy those. Brandon, Scott, RSJ, and Chad, thank you all so much for those notes of gratitude and encouragement. They go a long way these days, so it's very much appreciated. And a big thank you to everybody who continues to listen. Uh, send in those questions. We'll keep the podcast going. That's how it works. For AV Rant, I'm Tom Andre. And I'm Rob H. Now stay in and listen to something. Want your question answered? Send it to question at avrant.com. is A.V. Rant. Now go out and listen to something.